Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Adam and I'm the Community Lead at the Green Software Foundation. Hi, I'm Namrata and I'm the Director of Communications and Member Relations at the Green Software Foundation. Welcome to Decarbonize Software 2023. We've got over two and a half hours of amazing talks and demos from our green software community, including talks from many of our steering members. So for those of you who are new to our community, I want to take a minute to introduce you to the foundation. We're on a mission to, to make, um, to decarbonize software and reduce software's environmental impact. And we're making significant strides by building a trusted ecosystem of people, standards, tooling, and best practices for green software. In a short two years, we act, we've grown to represent the global software industry with over 60 members across the world who've chosen to exemplify green software practices. We couldn't have done today's event without the support of our steering members, many of whom you'll meet today. And before we go any further, let's take a look at our code of conduct slide. We're asking all of today's speakers, as well as everyone taking part in the live chat, to take notice. I'm not going to read all of these out to you. The big rule is be kind to each other. And if you have any concerns, take a look at those links on screen. You can view our full code of conduct. So here we have today's agenda. We have many amazing talks coming up from our members and our community. We hope you will stay with us for some amazing talks. And let's take a look at the second half of the agenda. In our second half, we've got even more member talks and we've got some great announcements from the Green Software Foundation itself, including hearing about our GSF Champions Programme and the new Impact Framework project. There's a lot to look forward to. Adam and I will be with you throughout the course of this event and we'll be joined by Asim and Sophie. So with that said, I'll pass the mic to Asim, our chairperson and executive director, to run you through our journey this past year. Thank you and welcome. And thank you for the amazing introduction. As Namata said, I'm Asim Hussain. I'm the chairperson and executive director of the Green Software Foundation. We've had an amazing year in 2023. It's been a challenging year, but we've had a really good uh, experience of it. If there's one word to describe the year this last year, it would be the word growth both in terms of what's happening in the foundation, but also the broader ecosystem. Kamuta, next slide, please. Um, let's first talk about the broader ecosystem. We've seen growth in several key trends in, in regulatory, in solutions, and also what I think is very important, a cultural change. For regulatory, you know, when we released the, soft, uh, the State of Green software earlier on this year, and one of the uh, items in there was about regulation, and we discovered that software legislation has quadrupled in the last decade, and nearly a third of, nearly a third of this legislation includes specific provisions for environmental regulation. In EU and America, we've seen broad, uh, broader regulation around reporting requirements, with the EU, we're talking about the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. And in the US, specifically in California, a bill has just passed um, for organizations that do business in California must now also do uh, carbon reporting. In the solution space, we're seeing multiple big tech companies adopting green software. Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM Cloud all now have cloud carbon dashboards so you as a customer can see the carbon emissions of your software running on those cloud platforms a uh, google microsoft and apple have all implemented carbon aware computing that is doing more when electricity is clean and doing less when it's dirty green software is a mainstream solution used by tech giants cultural and as i said before i deeply believe that the most important trend for change is a cultural change. Again, talking about the State of Green Software report, which we released earlier on this year, in there we discovered that 37% of CEOs view sustainability as a top priority for their business. We did surveys, and uh, in the survey, we, we spoke to um, uh, software practitioners, and 92% of software practitioners are concerned about climate change. We also asked them to rank sustainability with respect to other priorities and the sustainability ranks higher than performance and cost. 
And we're hearing from service providers and consultancies in our ecosystem that more businesses in, are inquiring about how green the software will be during the procurement process. A cultural shift is happening. Next slide, please. And within the GSF, we're seeing a lot of change as well, a lot of growth. We're having a lot of projects that are maturing. Um, the SCIs, the Software Carbon Intensity Specification, has been approved by ISO and will soon find its way into that catalogue. The Carbon Arrest SDK, which some of you might remember from our really successful hackathon last year, um, has now reached 1.1 and in just a few weeks will reach 1.2. The Green Software Practitioners course, which we launched at the last year's Decarbonized Software, now has 50, over 50,000 individuals have completed the course. And it's also garnered substantial acclaim and has a net promoter score of over 50. We have also had a lot of new projects. So we've had nine new projects launched. The impact framework from the open source working group is I actually co-lead that project with Srini and Naveen, who'll be joining me later on today as we have an early sneak peek to the alpha, which can be released today. And this project is all about software measurement. The green software maturity matrix is a, a new project from the community working group in incubation led by Anne Curie that aims to mature into a self-evaluation tool for organizations. Real-Time Cloud is our latest project from the Standards Working Group, led by Adrian Cockcroft, that will create a standard for cloud providers to surface real-time carbon data to customers. And that's just three of them. There's, there's six other projects, which unfortunately we don't have time to, to go through today, but they're also very, very exciting projects. In terms of executive programs, we're excited today to launch our latest exec program, which is the Green Software Champions Program. This is a place where we will recognize individuals who are making a meaningful impact in green software. This is our MVP program. Adam will be talking more about that later on today. Next slide, please. And let's just talk about in terms of our engagement. Um, we've had significant increases in our, in our engagement with all of our communication channels. Principles, our principles project has um, uh, the, the training project that we have has increased over a thousand percent completion since the start of this year. Our podcast subscribers, and I want to say a big thank you to Chris Adams for being the podcast host of Environment Rebels for the entirety of this year. He's been an amazing host, and our podcast has, has uh, over two hundred percent increase in subscribers. We now get about ten thousand um, uh, uh, downloads every single uh, month. Our website visits have increased dramatically. Our newsletter subscribers have increased uh, significantly. And this event, DCARB, is now almost double the number of participants for, for, since last year. Next slide, please. Now, the reason I'm talking about growth isn't to boast. It's the signal that this is a field of compute. This field of computing green software is growing and we are growing with it. We've seen in this year, 19 new member organizations have joined the, the Green Software Foundation. This includes two steering members. And we've also taken on seven new staff members. We're very, very excited about this. Let me hand over now to Adam, um, our MC for the event. Thanks very much, Asim. I'm really looking forward to seeing you later as well to talk about that new impact framework project, as well as uh, sharing what you're looking forward to in 2024. I think we already got a bit of a preview there. Um, now, um, throughout today's show, we're going to see some brilliant live presentations and demos from our GSF members and from our community. Um, Namrata, in fact, will be back in just under 90 seconds with the first of our guests today, Diana and Charlotte. Uh, we're going to be showing a, shoot, a few short videos from our GSF steering members. These are the members who set the direction of the Green Software Foundation, and we think they've got some really great stories to share. So let's roll the video for our first steering committee member, NTT Data. NTT Data is a trusted global innovator that helps clients transform their business through IT and business services. From strategic consulting to cutting-edge technology, we enable experiences that transform organizations for success, disrupt industries for good, and create a better society for all. We joined the GSS as a steering committee member in September 2021 to realize a world with green software. 
In collaboration with the GSF, we've been creating powerful tools such as SCI, Real-Time Cloud, and Carbon Aware SDK. They should be widely used in the IT industry, and as an IT service provider, we must use them for clients and society. We've already studied like the use of SCI to evaluate the existing IT system of a major European bank. We will continue to work with the GSF and accelerate the adoption of green software in society. Thanks to NTT Data for filming that video. Now we're going to hear from another steering member, BCG and their partner CO2AI. I'd like to welcome Charlotte Dickel from CO2AI and Diana Dimitrova from BCG. The GSF is focused on addressing the environmental impact of software. With the rise of AI, we wanted to take a moment at Decarb to discuss how this technology can assist our efforts to decarbonize software. Charlotte and Diana are here to cover this topic and highlight the results from the Carbon Emission Survey Report that was just released. Charlotte and Diana, over to you. Great, thanks so much. And thanks so much for hosting us um, today. We're, we're super pleased to be here. Uh, and as you mentioned, today was the launch date um, of our third annual uh, survey that actually found some fascinating insights around green software and how that propels um, climate action globally. So, so Charlotte and I are thrilled uh, to take you through it. So maybe as a first step, um, and if we can go to the next slide, um, we can just introduce ourselves. Charlotte? Yes, very nice. Um, um, to have us, uh, Charlotte Dego, I'm the founder and CEO of CO2AI. Just in a few words, CO2AI is a sustainability platform that helps large organizations on their end-to-end -end net zero journeys from measuring and reporting their emissions down to reducing and proving their impact. Excellent, and um, I'm Diana Dimitrova. I'm a managing director and partner uh, in BCG, and I focus on building digital solutions for clients um, that advance their climate goals. Uh, that's specifically in our unit called BCG X. Um, next slide. Um, I'm, I'm going to take you off. Uh, sorry, I'm going to kick us off with the main findings um, of the report, um, and and let me just contextualize that a little bit. So um, we published a third annual report. Um, uh, around carbon emissions uh, and measurement. It includes uh, 1,850 organizations um, that reported back to us. Uh, it does uh, represent over 20 countries in 18 major industries. And based on the reported emissions, it's about 40% of global emissions. And the report is called Why Some Companies Are Ahead in the Race to Net Zero. Now, what we found, um, you know, the unfortunate bit, which is the first column, is that comprehensive measurement of scope one, two, and three um, actually hasn't improved. It was 10% this year, was 10% the year before, and, and nine the year before that. So, so real stagnation there. Now, we did see some elements that gave us quite a bit of hope, and that was really in scope three. So in scope three measurement has landed at, at 53% or partial scope three measurement has landed at 53%, which is up 19 percentage points in two years. So we are seeing organizations actually um, be selective of which categories they measure, but really starting to get at scope three. And more interestingly is they've actually set targets and that's the 12 percentage points um, that you see on the bottom there. Organizations at this um, stage are uh, setting targets for scope three categories at 35% uh, rate, which is uh, a notable improvement. And regionally, um, we are seeing uh, uh, changes uh, and we are seeing certain regions pull ahead in the race. Um, and again, this is a scope one, two uh, and uh, the comprehensive measurement that they have. South America, APAC are really pulling ahead um, uh, when it comes to their measurement. And then finally, the most important bit is why are companies doing this and 40% and of um, the folks who responded are telling us, well, they do this because they're kind of seeing 100 million or more dollars in annual financial benefit when they get on the reduction journey. So there's a real financial incentive um, for them to uh, be tackling um, these massive challenges. And then let me tell you a little of how they did it on the next slide. Um, so these companies are doing four things twice as well as the average organization. 
The first thing that they're doing well is they're collaborating with their suppliers, meaning they have workshops together, they have joint targets, they have joint programs. So they're engineering products together for a lower carbon solution. The second bit is digital solutions that allow you to measure at a product level. So it's not good enough to just know what Apple's total emissions are. It's actually much more interesting to know what the iPhone's emissions are. And getting at that product level is, is fundamental to enable consumers to make a greener choice. Um, and, and the highest number on this slide, as you see, is the use of digital technologies. And, and Charlotte will give us a few examples of that. But those that adopt digital solutions or, or green software really make a dent um, versus those that don't. And then lastly, you know, I heard um, our host kick it off, you know, regulation. And those that view regulation in a positive way, catalyze around it, um, really are seeing those benefits um, when it comes to meeting their reduction targets. Now, to give you an example, um, I'm going to take you through um, a client where we've done this. And, and, and we can go to the next slide. The client is called Kluckner & Co. What does Kluckner do? Kluckner actually distributes steel. So steel is a heavy emitting sector. It represents 7% of the world's emissions. Um, we all have a stake in the ground to, to really decarbonize steel. Unfortunately, there is no net zero steel, but there is a lot greener steel than what we use on average. What Kluckner did is recognize that they needed to get to that product carbon footprint element, which is the second pillar I just talked about. So they actually built a um, software that was able to calculate their uh, product carbon footprint for over 200,000 products. And, and you see that's called Nexigen PCF algorithm. It's cradle to gate emissions. And it covers, as I said, 200,000 products, and it is certified, which makes it really, really important that whoever gets a number actually gets a certification. And then they decided that wasn't you know, good enough. They needed to push a little bit further. And then they created Nexigen Data Services, which is an online purchasing platform where anybody who's buying steel can log on and look at what the carbon footprint of their basket was in the last purchase and how what greener alternative is available to them. And so this platform around allows procurement individuals to actually really arbitrage where they're going to spend their carbon uh, because they're given the transparency and the choice to make the lower carbon solutions. So it's a great example of leveraging technology and getting at product carbon footprints, um, which is still a bit of a panacea that that organizations are, are gunning towards. Having said that, I'm going to hand it over to Charlotte and she'll take us through some of the other details on digital. Yes, thank you. Next. Next page, please. Thank you. So as Diana was saying, one of the four key things that companies who succeed better on their reduction journey do is adopting digital solutions. As you can see on the left part of the slide, what we see is that companies who use automated digital solutions are actually two times 2.5 times more likely to comprehensively measure their emissions. And this is very important because what gets measured gets done. So this is this this may look like a basics, but it's a basic that just sets the foundations right for you to then decarbonize. And what's also encouraging is that when we ask the um, uh, 1,800 companies who answered our survey, what is the number one enabler that they see and that they think they need to adopt to accelerate on emissions reduction, they quote technology uh, as the first enabler before leadership buy-in, before sustainability focused uh, culture. So it really means that they have uh, perceived the importance of digital and that uh, we can hope for a wave of adoption uh, in, the, in the years to come. Next page, please. I just want to give you one example from uh, real life of what it means to be using tech and how it can bring value to uh, a very large and complex organization. We are talking here about the economist group, so the press media uh, group, as you know, they are very large and they uh, um, they uh, issue a lot of newspapers. Uh, they are very committed to sustainability. And what uh, they do with technology is using CO2 AI um, to help them uh, steer their end-to-end -end, uh, net, net zero journey. So what uh, they use it for is first to measure and automate their carbon footprint calculations. They have a very complex carbon footprint. They need to capture a lot of data points and CO2 AI helps them collect those data points, structure those data points and get to a level of uh, granularity in their footprint, which is really good and really helpful to make decisions. 
The second thing that they do with CO2 AI is to really set up a roadmap and define uh, the hotspots and the reduction levers that go with the roadmap so that they really have a plan and they can cascade the plan uh, across the organization. This is a big pain point that sustainability face team um, sustainability teams face today. They tend to have targets but uh, high level plans and no resources to actually uh, make that happen. Technology can really help broadcasting the information, make sure that operational teams get involved into um, the decarbonization journey. And last but not least, as we were saying, scope three, so the emissions that come from outside the direct operations of the company, typically the emissions from the supply chain, the suppliers, etc., are um, extremely important. They are on average 90% of total emissions, and those are the hardest uh, to tackle. What um, The Economist is doing with CO2AI is mapping suppliers and uh, being able to really um, prioritize with, who, uh, with what suppliers to engage and what uh, to discuss with them to go at a level of granularity, we were talking about product level, uh, at a level of granularity, which is good enough to have uh, proper discussions about reductions and, uh, and uh, impact uh, measurement. Next page, please. Finally, I want to say a few words about AI before taking questions. Uh, we talked about uh, tech and digital in a broad sense, which is extremely helpful and, uh, and will uh, drastically help us accelerate on our sustainability journey. In this field, um, artificial intelligence is extremely important. Um, you see here on the page 30% of respondents who plan to adopt AI uh, to uh, steer their net zero sustainability um, a journey moving forward. Uh, they see uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, as an enabler and a helpful way on many different, di different dimensions. Uh, a couple of ones are making intelligent decisions, typically on energy usage or decarbonization initiative. Artificial intelligence is a key lever to automate and increase the quality of uh, carbon footprints. This is what we do at CO2AI, and I could talk uh, for hours about that, but there is a huge accuracy issue and granularity issue when carbon, on carbon footprint when made manually, and artificial intelligence can really help solve uh, this topic. And finally, making predictions and making sure that uh, roadmaps ahead, both from a business and from a sustainability standpoint, are, are optimized. Next page, please. So we're reaching the end of our presentation. You have two QR codes here to uh, go deeper into either the report or what we do more generally. And I think it's time to take uh, questions. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I know we've got a ton of questions to follow up with, but first, um, I do see you've got a few audience questions, so I'm going to ask you both. The first one is from John Bonnet, uh, and he's asking about the baseline. He said two times of 10 companies is not so great, but two in 100,000 companies is a great achievement. So could you comment on, on that? I guess the question is related to uh, the four levers that accelerate and that uh, multiply by two the likelihood of uh, managing your reduction journey. So what I can say is that what we ask for in the survey is what percentage of companies are measuring their emissions comprehensively. And as Diana was saying, uh, this has not moved and this is stagnating at 10%. And the other key metric that we ask for in the survey is how what percentage of companies have actually managed to reduce their emissions in line with their ambition. And here this number is 14%. So um, I will I will see the glass uh, half empty on this question and I will say that the baseline is not high enough and we need to really accelerate the adoption of those four levers and that will uh, increase the baseline. Thank you so much. And then we have a question with regards to the carbon emissions survey, a couple which I'm going to, you know, group together. So one is um, how many companies were part of the survey and did the survey find any advice uh, regarding how to decarbonize AI itself since it's also a cause of emissions? 
Great. So, I mean, let me take the first part in Charlotte. I think you can comment on AI itself. So it was 1,850 organizations up from 1,600 last year and up from 1,450 the year before. So we have been seeing a steady interest uh, in folks giving us this information back. Um, and the sample is hoovering for some of the kind of large organizations that are between 10 and 25,000 uh, employees. Uh, and it said, based on their self-declaration, it was 40,000% of global emissions. Um, so we're, we're quite comfortable with the sample um, that came through this year. And on um, uh, uh, how to reduce the footprint of AI, this was not part of the questions we've been asking uh, on the survey, but what I can say is that um, there are uh, many ways to optimize uh, the um, carbon emissions of any model. Uh, there are also tools that exist like Code Carbon, etc. I'm not going to teach anything to this uh, group about it, uh, but clearly um, the impact of AI needs to be monitored as any other type of impact and it needs to be used uh, wisely. Well, Charlotte and Diana, thank you so much. There are several more questions, so we might have to come back to you at a later time um, to, to get them answered. Thank you so much for joining us uh, at DCARB. Um, for everybody on the call, don't forget that our event is available on demand. Um, coming up, we'll meet a GSF member who has utilized the GSF principles and patterns to instill a culture of engineering excellence. First, let's hear from our steering committee member, Accenture. Accenture is a founding member of the Green Software Foundation. When we began our mission, our goal was to establish an open community, leveraging collective intelligence uh, to set new standards, spur innovation, and promote the development and advancement of green software that reduces carbon emission. Green software was a relatively new concept back then. And I'm very proud to highlight that in just over two and a half years, uh, we have established the first standard for measuring software carbon emission and launched a certification for green software, which is open to all. Furthermore, we are educating software engineers in this area and have integrated innovations like uh, green software patterns uh, into well-architected frameworks. Our primary aim was to foster the widespread adoption of green software through community-driven approach and encourage companies uh, to embed sustainability by design for more positive impact on the environment. And it's very heartening to see the significant growth and positive impact of the Green Software Foundation for the past uh, two and a half years. Yeah, I think new innovations like uh, AI powered coding tools uh, that are designed to produce green code or retrofit legacy code into energy efficient alternatives are an exciting development to follow. Another emerging trend is responsible AI practices that consider ethics, governance, and sustainability. And given the significant uh, computing power required by large language models uh, during both training and inference, organizations are looking carefully at how to balance the value of generative AI solutions uh, with the potential environmental impact. Also, energy efficient generative AI solutions uh, can be an important part of discovering new opportunities uh, to reduce uh, carbon emissions. Thank you to Naveen from Accenture. In fact, we'll be hearing from him again later in the show. Now, let's hear from an organisation really committed to engineering excellence, EPAM. EPAM are a general member of the Green Software Foundation, and Chris Howard, who leads their open source program office, has been building a culture of learning using the green software principles and patterns. That's our learning and best practice materials. Chris, it's great to have you with us today. I'm really keen to hear more about EPAM's journey in the green software space. So over to you. Excellent. Thanks so much for, for having me here. It's a, a real privilege to, to be joining. And I know last year I was listening, so it's fantastic to be here speaking uh, this year. So uh, yeah, absolutely. My name is Chris Howard. I'm the head of the open source program office here at EPAM. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, how we're engineering excellence, which is one of our kind of taglines around uh, sustainability and green software. So I think I have some slides hopefully coming up. Amazing. Perfect. Uh, and my first slide, really, let's jump straight into that. Um, it's quite a big statement, really. Um, the, the idea 
that building sustainable software isn't simple. Probably not a surprise to many of you on the call that there are some fairly unique challenges um, around um, some fairly unique challenges uh, around the sorry, apologies. So fairly unique challenges around software development, um, which is probably not a surprise to all of you. But a key goal really for us here at EPAM as a software engineering company and consultancy is being able to support our clients with 60,000 headcount across the globe on building uh, great software solutions and increasingly so ones that are greener and more sustainable and of course are aligned to our environmental and our clients' environmental targets. And a big value now in, in delivering great software is that idea around being able to demonstrate a, a, a less environmental impact, something that perhaps uh, maybe 10 years ago wasn't at the forefront of our thinking is now becoming increasingly more embedded in, in the work that we're doing. And some of those challenges around building sustainable software you can see on the screen uh, on the right, for example, things like infrastructure and historical architecture, systems that were built at a time when uh, environmental concerns just weren't necessarily at the top of people's agenda. Moving down into things around governance and legislation, we would all love to be able to shift our kind of execution and our data centers to the most sustainable kind of green uh, areas of the world. But at the same time, sometimes we run up against challenges about hosting data in geographies that perhaps don't meet things like GDPR compliance. Similarly, shifting requirements and scope, uh, of course, a, a massive part of many of our delivery roles is about keeping our clients happy. Uh, and a big part of that sometimes means changing scope. And of course, assumptions that have been made around sustainability then are vastly kind of thrown uh, off, off track. And finally, many of you will uh, get to this in terms of on time and on budget. Well, of course, we want to deliver on time and on budget, of course, as a services provider, but also we have to think about, are we now delivering the right thing? Is this the right thing to do? So uh, if we move on to the uh, next slide, what does that look like? Well, how have we approached this? Uh, on the left of the diagram here, you can see a very simplified view of um, EPAM's offerings as a kind of leading software engineering company. Uh, and please don't think that that's all we do. That's just my way of trying to communicate this to you today. And on the right, uh, you can hopefully see uh, and you're familiar with the practices and patterns of the Green Software Foundation. And we've been exploring since we joined uh, in 2022, as a member, as Adam pointed out, how we can start to amalgamate and bring these principles and practices together to not only educate our engineers and our software practitioners, but also start to enable us to build far more greener, environmentally aware, and hopefully better software for our clients. So what have we been doing so far? Well, the next slide is going to show you the kind of three first initiatives that we've really implemented. The first is we immediately, as we even heard talking about right at the beginning of the conference today, integrated that GSF uh, practitioners course into our own learning platforms. And that gave us three quick wins. The first was that it gave access and visibility to that course to EPAMers, as we call them, um, that they can see these courses uh, available to them that perhaps they were totally ignorant of and didn't necessarily know. Secondly, we can now lobby our competency and our business unit heads to integrate this course into their own learning pathways. So as they're building engineering pathways and career paths, et cetera, we want to make sure that they're also thinking about embedding green software practices and sustainability conversations into that. And thirdly, the real value of data, as I'm sure we will talk about on a day to day, is that it provides us some of our own metrics around how many of our own engineers, analysts, testers are completing the certification. I think we heard 50,000 uh, people have completed the course anyway globally outside of uh, uh, EPAM, not just 50,000 EPAMers. Uh, this helps us with our client conversations around demonstrating certification. Secondly, though, and this is something I was super passionate about, is we identified uh, individuals who are enthusiastic about enthusiastic about sustainability within the company we set up a working group and that working group is architects engineers devops experts and a few consultants and project managers to keep everyone in check um, to do a bit of a review with a critical audit and i say that respectfully of those uh, gsf practices so we took them on board we had a look at what they were and we said we like this we love that how this works or similarly we think we can elaborate that a little bit more and we started to shape those and uh, adopt them and adapt them a little bit to fit through an epam lens kind of matching our day to day. And third, on the back of that kind of adopt and adapt is that we then started to think about how do we align those to our existing deliveries. So this was about educating our delivery managers, our project managers on green software, but also building a new layer on top. So take those good, great ideas, build a new layer on top with that kind of EPAM specific way of working. 
And then in the spirit of open source, which hopefully you understand and very passionate about, we absolutely are of the uh, uh, impression that we will contribute these back to the Green Software Foundation as part of that long tail initiative. So it's not about just taking and enhancing, we definitely are going to give back. So watch this space. So now we have those three actions. What does that model look like? Well, if we go to the next slide uh, and we think about those th those two kind of conflicting frameworks, if you like, we want to amalgamate them together. The next slide now shows you kind of how we've layered them on top of each other. And this is a, a very, very basic diagram. So hopefully you're seeing that on screen now, the, the next diagram, um, which is coming up perfectly. Nice animation there as well. This is the first time you've ever seen this, and apologies, I'm not the, the best uh, PowerPoint expert, but what we've tried to do now, thinking from a bottom, top-up approach, is at the first level, educating and embedding those principles as underpinning all of our activities. So what we're talking about here is not changing the values and standards of our organization. And as much as we respect the GSF, that's not what we were looking for, for the value to be delivered there. But instead, how can we think about those three key areas, uh, those three key principles? How can we embed those alongside our already existing environmental initiatives? So we've made those a bit of a bedrock, a bit of a foundation. We then move up and we talk about all of our delivery activities. You can see lots of those little boxes. And on top of that, you can start to see we're now layering the idea of building on top some of those patterns into our existing functional areas. So that's two things. That's either saying, we love this idea. This is a great idea. We've seen that you've, you've put this into your, uh, into your GSF patterns. We're going to take that and we're just going to build that into our ways of working. That's perfect. Similarly, part of that working group that are adopting and adapting these we're also saying we like this idea, but we want to chop and change it a little bit. And actually, we're going to enable that to now sit alongside and complement some of our other standard ways of working, particularly within stuff like cloud, for example, our development approaches. And that layering then kind of adds on top. So this is this idea of taking the best thing and just improving, really building on. And then the area I haven't spoken about is that idea about taking those patterns and then evolving those into practices that we can actually start to apply to our own systems. So for us, we're doing a proof of concept at the moment about taking some of these patterns and actually establishing a practice around one of our internal HR platforms to implement the SCI, the Software Carbon Index uh, in specification, to, to measure the performance. Then we'll get the working group back on board and we'll say, OK, let's think about how we can take some of these practices and, and put them into, into, into practice um, to see if we can make some changes, some efficiency gains, reduce energy consumption. And then what's exciting is actually we now say as a products company as well is that from day one now of building products and solutions, we'll make sure that sustainability, the green conversation is there from day one and we're not having to retrospectively go in and start to apply this. And if I take this one step further in the last few minutes and go to the next slide, we can see this kind of typical consultancy fashion, a bit of a, a value stream build here. So what I'm calling a, a value chain of sustainable engineering excellence, this idea that you can move all the way up uh, from these very embedded principles right at the bottom. So thinking about hardware needs, embedded carbon, into that development phase there. So coding only what's needed, good code quality, all of that kind of good day to day, but with a bit more of an environmental lens. And we keep shifting up and up and up into our patterns. So building performance solutions, reducing energy consumption through some of the great initiatives and ideas that GSF has. And then with our special working group on top, who are really leveraging their expertise in this space, building some fantastic patterns to make sure our tooling, our infrastructure, everything we use to help our clients in our deliveries are as efficient, as sustainable as possible. So that's been a bit of a whirlwind tour. I think my final slide is a thank you slide uh, and a call to action. If you if you want to chat more, if there's my Twitter, please do get in touch with me. But a real kind of whirlwind as to how we've been taking what we really value and appreciate from the GSF in these community sourced patterns, practices. And we've been able to shift and adapt those to, to really help in our own engineering excellence journey. Wow, thank you so much, Chris. That was an amazing overview, um, and I'm really impressed by the work that EPAM has, doing, has been doing to really mainstream these principles and patterns into uh, into that culture of learning. Um, I, you know, I'm sure a lot of our listeners will really uh, you know, will have been really interested in how you're bringing the engineers along on the journey and including those working groups. Um, so we had a, a question, um, and actually the question was, um, how do you um, demonstrate the impact of your efforts? I want to build upon that a bit and actually um, ask whether you think that all of this work, not only does this make you a better organisation, a greener organisation, a better employer, do you think that gives you the edge with your customers as well in a measurable way? 
Yeah, I think it does. And obviously, I can't mention names, but we've explicitly been asked over the last six to 12 months how many, and you'll love to hear this, Adam, how many of your engineers have GSF certification. So we know there's a market demand for it. We know there's a revenue attached to that. And also, 10 years ago, we were talking about building in DNI policies, for example, into procurement and RFPs, sign of client requests. Now, very much sustainability is at the forefront of that. So, as much as I can say this is great for business, this makes us look like an attractive kind of uh, company. To, to, to deliver those client projects. It's also really important not to forget the, the motivation behind this and why we're all here today is that, yes, the revenue is important, but actually this is the right thing to do, to be building a kind of conscious, sustainable set of software solutions to help us all really fight those climate challenges. So, yes, it's attractive, of course, but sometimes we have to do that kind of balancing act between the right thing to do versus that on-time and budget analogy I gave earlier. Brilliant. Um, there's a big question for Milalina in the chat, and um, the question's around how do you think designers and UX professionals can be brought into the mix with sustainable software? I guess this comes into the question of, um, you know, with the Green Software Foundation, we talk about software practitioners, not just developers. So, um, you know, who do, who do you include in, the, in that journey? Yeah, it's a good question. And actually, it sits really similar with open source and a big question I get asked all the time around non-code contributors, because I think sometimes we get held up on this idea of engineers being the kind of game changers or the, or the kind of feet on the ground. And I think it, it works for both ways, is that actually, if we bring everyone to the table to have this conversation and we provide a forum for those designers, for those AV engineers, for the people that perhaps aren't writing the code, actually, and we provide a safe space for them to say, well, why don't we why don't we approach it this way, or why don't we do it this way, or I know you're pushing back on this, or or you want to deliver an X Y Z, and we bring in some of those ways of thinking around sustainability. So take a super trivial thing like caching images, or headless architectures, or things like that, and we get everyone to be part of that initial architectural kind of shaping conversation. It's at that stage that I think we can bring everyone along with the fold. There's nothing worse, and I'm sure many people listening, than being in a project and something three, four months down the line suddenly coming to you and saying, well, it's not possible or it's not this isn't a viable solution if we take that lens as well with the environmental view as well and say actually why are we doing this so why are we executing this way when it doesn't match the most underground kind of baseline foundations we try to establish then i think we can all be in a better position so i'd love to talk about that more i think there's loads of overlay between open source and non-code contributions and bringing those other people but this is a good a great starting point definitely Brilliant. Well, you know, thank you very much. I mean, that, that's, um, you know, that's, I think for me, actually, yeah, so I'm not, a, I'm not a developer and I'm in the, you know, the green software space. And uh, it's always really important for people like me to feel they're part of that journey as well. And to, to, to know that software is, you know, it, is it actually got this huge army of people contributing into it, these, all of these non-code contributors. Um, I, I have way more questions. I'm really sorry. We're, we're going to have to try and answer those afterwards. Um, Chris, thank you so much for giving such a brilliant example of how, how these principles and patterns can be put into practice. Um, I know that we don't have this link on the screen, but we're going to share it in the chat. For anyone that is interested in starting their learning journey, go to learn.greensoftware.foundation. Um, that's got um, all the principles content, and then you can follow on with those patterns, those best practices afterwards. Um, Chris, thank you very much, and um, I know that we'll be seeing you again very soon. Absolutely. Have a great day. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Cool. So um, next up, we've got another video from one of our steering members, and this time we're going to meet Matt Crop from BCG. Let's roll the video. Hi, I'm Matthew Crop, Managing Director and Senior Partner out of the BCG San Francisco office. Since 2022, I've proudly served on the Green Software Foundation's steering committee. BCG joined the GSF as part of our unwavering commitment to reduce the environmental impact of software development and to collaborate on driving change through their trusted ecosystem of people, standards, and tools. Together, we aim to raise awareness around software's environmental impact and share best practices on how to mitigate it. We have the opportunity to make the software industry net zero, but it will take measurement, awareness, and empowerment to get there. BCG and GSF envision a future where sustainability is at the core of software development. As a steering committee member, we continue to collaborate and share our expertise in making sustainable standards the norm, easily accessible and innovation driven. Thanks Matt at BCG for the video. 
Hi everyone, I'm Sophie, the Technical Project Manager for our open source projects at the Green Software Foundation. Today I'm going to introduce a special fireside chat to our Decarbonize Software event. We're continuing the conversation that began on the 5th of October at our panel on Responsible AI. The conversation surrounding Responsible AI is dynamic, oscillating between optimism and scepticism. On one side, practitioners believe that AI has the potential to drive sustainable development goals from responsible consumption to waste management and energy conservation. The promise lies in our improvements in measuring software's environmental impacts and innovation across energy efficient algorithms, hardware optimizations, and the growing use of renewable energy sources. On the other side, the rapid expansion of AI, particularly large learning language models, and the insatiable demand for this technology are raising concerns. If left unchecked, the energy consumption and resource utilization associated with AI make many feel like we're endangering a future where software causes zero harmful environmental impacts. To help us explore the path forward, I'm thrilled to introduce Tammy McClellan, Senior Cloud Solution Architect at Microsoft, and Jesse McCroskey, Head of Responsible Tech and Principal Data Scientist at ThoughtWorks. Thanks both, take it away. Thanks, Sophie, and a hello to all you sustainability addicts. Jesse, hello. Let's start the question with, uh, how do you see the relationship between responsible AI and sustainability? Sorry, I can't believe the timing there, but my internet went down just as I was coming oh, into the call. No. So um, <laughs> can you please uh, repeat that? Sure. How do you see the relationship between responsible AI and sustainability? Hey, Tammy, great question and nice to see you all. Um, so at ThoughtWorks, we uh, use a framework that I like, which we refer to as the greening of tech and greening by tech. And I think this is the best lens through which to view that question. Um, greening of tech refers to the fact that these systems and especially generative AI, as we're talking about now, have you know, serious energy consumption. They have serious sustainability issues that need to be tackled. Um, the other side is the greening by tech and recognizes the potential that this technology has to actually improve sustainability of other processes, either within or outside of the, the tech world. And I think what ties these, um, these two questions together is issues of transparency and information and ensuring that people have the information they need to make the right decisions for our environment. I, I like that, greening of tech and greening for tech. It's my new mantra now. So how can uh, we use this to make more sustainable solutions? So it's a, a big question. Um, to begin with, I think that I, I referred to transparency. And when we talk about transparency, a lot of people think that means you share your source code or you share your model weights and then you're transparent, or it means you have to explain the decisions the AI is making and that's transparency. Transparency is more than that. Um, there's a report I did with the Mozilla Foundation on AI transparency. We talk about meaningful AI transparency that needs to be legible, auditable, and actionable. And this means that we have to consider the specific stakeholders that the information is being provided to. What are their needs? What are they going to do with this information? So it comes down to you know the, the old adage that you can't manage what you can't measure. So for example, in order to support meaningful policy, meaningful regulation, we need to have information about the, the sustainability characteristics of these systems. So um, talk to us a little bit about um, some possible solutions in this area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we're looking at solutions, especially using the kind of transparency lens, we can think about who is the transparency being provided to. So for example, we can talk about consumers. And right now, consumers are very excited about ChatGPT or whatever else, they, you know, stable diffusion, DALI, and everything like that. It's a lot of fun to play with. And they do not have meaningful information about the, the carbon implications of that play. 
So a, someone was suggesting to me that ChatGPT should have a real-time counter across the top somewhere that's telling you how much carbon have you emitted so far in your session, how many you know gallons of water have been consumed, whatever else. And it, it's not a matter of just shaming people, but it's helping people make the right choices because there might be applications for which ChatGPT is really worthwhile to use, but there's other times that somebody's just idly playing or something like that. And if they realize the implications of what they're doing, they might make other choices. This becomes more interesting when we talk about communication between, for example, model developers and model deployers. Uh, so for example, if somebody is using the OpenAI APIs in their product, they need to be able to have information about what, what the implications are of those API calls so they can make good choices in how they build their software. So awareness is key, absolutely. Um, so Jesse, what is the potential for Gen AI to support greater sustainability? Yeah, it's an exciting question. And I think that there is some potential here. Um, there's a case that ThoughtWorks took, um, it's a couple of years back now, I think, in which we worked with a international manufacturing and services company. Uh, they were interested in finding solutions to meet their sustainability goals. And they just weren't sure which way to go. They weren't sure, should we start you know, sourcing our energy from a different place or using different sorts of transportation or using you know, different industrial processes or offering different products. And so what we did for them was um, built sort of a mathematical model of their operations and their supply chains. And once we had that mathematical model, we were able to build a sort of scenario modeling dashboard where we could show them like, hey, if you switch to delivery trucks that are using electricity instead of gas, this is what happens to your emissions. This is what happens to your bottom line. This is what happens to your customers. And likewise, depending on considering different product uh, mixes, considering different sourcing, whatever else. Um, so the mathematical model here was not rocket science, to be honest. It was fairly simple stuff. The hard part of this engagement was really understanding the business at the level that we needed to in order to build that model. There were many, many, many hours of interviews and pouring over notes and internal documents and everything else, um, as well as actually some basic desk research to like determine the necessary carbon emissions factors, that sort of thing. I'm excited by the potential of uh, generative AI to make this sort of process more accessible and more scalable. And I think that we've seen evidence so far that these models do a very good job of looking at these sorts of documents, looking at recordings of interviews, and it may be possible that you can kind of create this model semi-automatically with you know far, 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 far less uh, of the kind of like, you know, very heavyweight and expensive uh, sorts of interventions. As well, it was challenging to understand uh, exchangeability. And so, for example, if the company is buying cotton in one particular country, they might be obvious to us that they can instead buy the same cotton from some other country and that's the one possible change that could be made. But it's not so simple for the model to figure that sort of thing out automatically. Whereas Gen AI, I think when we connect to these sorts of emissions factors databases has the potential to make this process much, much easier. That's awesome. Um, let's move uh, a little bit and talk about risks. Um, how do you think businesses can manage the risks of AI? Yeah, it's, it's a big question. I think everybody's talking about this. Um, and I, I think what I would say is it's critical to understand that risks must be mitigated, not, not removed. I think a lot of people are talking, for example, about you know bias and discrimination, and they say, okay, we're going to produce a model that's you know perfectly fair and perfectly unbiased, or we're going we're to eliminate this bias from our model or whatever else. Um, and this is just not the way things work. So we live in the real world and these systems are based on data from the real world and the real world is unjust. And so we need to be able to be ready to tackle that. So um, what, one example that I like is uh, OpenAI with their DALI image generation uh, system. For a while, um, maybe some months ago, I think, if you asked it for pictures of lawyers, it was gonna give you, you know, eight pictures of white men basically. and. OpenAI recognized that there was a problem here, as did the community, of course. Um, so eventually, OpenAI had a uh, a short um, a uh, short blog post where they talked about how they were um, going to fix this, and they um, it, was, it was apparently fixed. So when people tried to get pictures, they would see pictures of lawyers, and some of them would be women, and some of them would be of different ethnicities and everything else. Um, so. 
people were curious how this had been fixed. And it turned out that all that OpenAI was doing was just randomly appending words like women or black or Asian or whatever else to, to these prompts. And people were not super impressed with this solution, but I think it's an important illustrative example because it's a mitigation. There was a problem with the model. There was a problem with the data. This is not a problem that can be solved fundamentally. It needed to be mitigated. And they found a way. They said, here's the harm that's going to come from the system. It's going to not be producing adequate representation. And we found a way that we can show more representation. So this is the sort of mitigation that companies need to take. So when there's issues, and this is where transparency comes in around uh, the carbon impacts as well, so that they can be mitigated. So that if I'm an engineer sitting in front of my laptop writing some software, I need to have awareness that if I call this Gen AI call or whatever else, I have to understand this is going to spike the uh, carbon emissions of my product and I need to find another solution. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, tell me, so are you optimistic or pessimistic about Gen AI at this point? I think I'm mixed. I think that um, ultimately solving the climate crisis means simultaneously solving a social crisis. And I think it's very hard to solve climate change without also solving issues of social justice globally. And I think that Gen AI is a tool that might enable some of these conversations to be tackled in a more interesting way. So I think as long as we're mindful and honest and clear eyed about how we apply this technology, that there, there can be some optimism there. We need to ensure that, that we have adequate transparency so that people understand the carbon implications of the choices they're making when they're using these systems. But given that there is potential to, uh, to do better. Gotcha. So I know uh, when you and I chatted before, uh, you said that you had a fun story of, of AI did you want to tell the tell us what that is? Uh, so actually, I think it was a misunderstanding. The fun story was oh. kind of an expanded version of what I was talking about before. But um, gotcha. if, if we have a moment, I think one thing I want to add when we come back to the idea of how uh, how transparency can help GNAI be used more responsibly. Um, so, so a lot of people are familiar with the concepts of uh, DevOps or MLOps or CD4ML, these sorts of processes. And I think this is a really critical place for transparency around carbon emissions to be integrated. I think the, um, the point I would make is that right now a software developer that's working in kind of a modern setup has the ability as they're writing code to see immediately if the code that they're changing is causing some test to fail or is causing some performance degradation or is introducing some bug or whatever else. And I think we need to have the same process for carbon so that it, if an engineer is making a choice and you know, for any, for any devs out there, you know, maybe you have a case where you need to use a regular expression, but it seems like too much work to figure it out. So like, hey, I can just call you know, a Gen AI model and it'll do it for me as well. It'll work just fine. And you might make that choice because it saves you a couple minutes or whatever. But if you then see that all of a sudden, you know, your, your dashboard turns red and says, okay, your carbon has just increased like 100% or whatever, you're going to come back and you're going to revisit that decision. And also your team is going to see the kind of the, the trail of what's uh, happening because of what you've done. And so it creates this sort of accountability in the development process. All right. So um, I'm curious. What are the top three recommendations you would give to people who are interested in reducing carbon emissions of AI? Good questions. Um, and yeah, I think that's something I didn't really touch on so far, but there are a lot of choices that can be made when applying AI. So we don't need to use the biggest general purpose models for everything. I think that there are cases where a general purpose model is really needed, but um, I think that in most cases, no. And so we can talk about using much simpler, you know, application specific models. We can talk about using a smaller model and but fine tuning it for the particular task. There's processes like quantization and distillation that can make models much more carbon efficient and nearly as effective So investigating these options. And again, I think this kind of hinges on the, the ML ops setup where you need to be ready to evaluate performance. You need to be able to say, how small can I make this model? and still actually meet the requirements in my product. Uh, beyond that, I think it's a matter of providing transparency to the end user. So if you're producing something, you know, 
its users understand the choices that they're making when they're when they're using that product. Um, there's a lot of different ways this can play out, and this can mean you know some Gen AI chatbot or something like that. But this also can be maybe you have an e-commerce product uh, uh, platform and you're using AI to make recommendations to your users, and the recommendations that you make can influence their behavior and it can encourage them to buy more products that are going to be disposable or made in very carbon-intensive ways. And so considering these sorts of externalities as well is really critical. Gotcha. Um, I'm curious, do we have any uh, questions from, from the audience at this point? Yes, we do. And uh, thank you so much, Tammy and Jesse. It's been a really great session uh, on AI here at DCARB, and it really shows the passion in the industry for these technologies plus the responsibility that we all must take when it comes to AI. I know we'll be hearing a lot more in the coming months. But yes, we've got a few questions from the audience. Um, I just want to shout out first, Jesse, thanks for the fun story on OpenAI, um, how they were mitigating the problem with data to show more representation through mitigation. It was a really uh, interesting insight, thanks. So one question from the audience, how important is prompt engineering for improvement of AI efficiency? Great question, yes. And it's uh, it's really extremely important because the energy being consumed by the model is going to depend in some complex ways, depending on how many tokens are coming into it and in a quite direct sense, how many tokens are coming out of it. So if we can reduce the number of tokens going through the system, we reduce the carbon emissions. Um, and this again, I know I'm sounding like a stuck record here, but it really depends on the analog setup where we should be able to test and see how short can we make our prompts and still accomplish what we need to do. And this is both the length of the prompt itself and the length of the output. So for example, you know, go back to that example I was talking about where maybe ChatGPT has a little indicator at the top telling you uh, how much carbon has been emitted in your, your session so far. Maybe if you see that number growing as you're chatting with it, you're going to say, hey, ChatGPT, please be a little bit more brief with your answers. I don't need the whole kind of colorful language and you know, going on and on about everything. Um, so yes, it's, it's very important. Super interesting, thank you. We've got another one sort of on training the AI ML model, which obviously takes a huge amount of data and processing, which in turn causes a lot of emissions. How do you think that we could best counterpart the same? Yeah, good question. And I think that, you know, I, I have an article uh, out where I actually talk about how the comparisons are a little bit overwrought, talking about how training a model is the equivalent of driving a car or some distance or whatever. I think that um, the comparison, at least so far, thankfully, is not quite accurate because we have, you know, many, many, many cars on the vehicle and a relatively small number of uh, models being trained. I think the important thing is to keep it that way. I think the important thing is that we need to encourage use of open models and shared models rather than every single organization in the world trying to train their own LLM. Um, and this is why I would be a strong supporter of open source models. I think it's nice to see that movement. I think it's uh, potential. It, uh, it means that organizations, first of all, save their money, but also save the carbon when they want to be able to you know, explore LLMs in their business. And there's always the potential for, uh, for fine tuning, for you know, whatever other tools need to be applied to these open models to make them suit people's applications. Amazing, thank you. And jumping back to uh, sort of problems on data and representation, we've got a, another question centered around that. So do you think we should promote digital humanism and ethical AI to raise awareness about the need for sustainable AI? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're existing at a moment where responsible AI and such is you know, being discussed everywhere. There's you know, very active regulatory work in you know, many different regions of the world. There's many people in academia and civil society and in industry doing this sort of work. And I think that uh, green AI sh you know, should come along for the ride, so to speak, and it should be an important you know, part of how we think about the risks and the potentials of these models. So yes. Amazing, thank you. I think that's it on the question front, but people do keep um, funneling your questions into the live chat and we'll see if we can answer some uh, in a blog post later on. Thanks very much. Up next, we are meeting three students from Code University in Berlin. 
But first, let's hear from Marco Valtus. He works for one of our steering committee members, ThoughtWorks. Thanks. In May of 2021, ThoughtWorks, alongside with Microsoft, GitHub, and Accenture, co-founded the Green Software Foundation. Our objective is to establish best practices, standards, and approaches for green software creation. We aim to shift the software development culture within the tech sector, making sustainability as important to software teams as performance, security, cost, and accessibility. We are excited about the software carbon efficiency rating project from the standards working group. We aim to use our standard, the Software Carbon Intensity, or SCI, to craft specifications for comparing different software categories. While the SCI is aimed more to a technical folks, the SCER is for the general public. Just like appliances have energy ratings, we want a similar scale for software. This will guide consumers and help vendors market and shape their software development towards greener products. Thank you to ThoughtWorks for sharing that video with us. Now we're, men we're welcoming a student team from Code University in Berlin. Let's welcome Johan and Yvette to the stage. Now for us here in the GSF, 2024 is all about measurement. Measurement is exactly what Johan and Yvette and their team have been working on for their project. I'm really excited to see it. There's even going to be a live demo. So Johan and Yvette, let's hear from you. Over to you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you for having us. So my name is so Yvette. I'm a software engineering student. Here at Code yeah, University in Berlin. Berlin. And, and this is currently, this is currently a student project a student that project is ongoing. ongoing. So we we would love to share our progress with you guys. I will hand over to Johan. Yeah, also a quick welcome from my side. And um, so our presentation isn't in split in two parts. And the first part is Yvette um, going through the presentation, then I will show you a small demo of what we've built so far. Yeah, let's jump right into it. Um, well, we start with the presentation, right? We have our slides. Okay. Um, well, then I will. I know. Okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead with, we'll with the. Sorry. Sorry with the hiccups. We'll go ahead with our project. So our project mainly focuses on observability for software energy consumption. Um, this is to uh, kind of provide a unified view of uh, measuring our energy consumption. Um, if you go over to the next slide, our problem statement. So on our problem statement, you can see that we have uh, our problem focuses on measuring the energy consumption of our software application across the full stack. So across the full stack, you can see uh, components such as database, backend, um, our front-end client services. But in order to optimize, we have to be able to measure. And hence, this is why we came up with the approach to kind of develop a tool that can help us measure these energy consumptions accurately. Our goals for this project is just uh, measure energy consumption, provide an easy setup, also provide sensors 
that goes all around all the relevant platforms involved in software development. So this led us to also pick out <coughs> existing solutions that are out there, like Power API. We also came across the Impact Engine Framework also that we will talk about later in our slides. We also uh, plan to give you a monitoring system, which comes in a board of a dashboard that you can see this data on and eventually be able to export this data to analyze them. In our next slides, you will see that we have the SCI score. So the SCI score has uh, the energy formula. So our project seeks to also, as an additional benefit, you are able to kind of uh, get your energy uh, data straight away instead of measuring it component by component. And this is what we also seek to provide for this uh, software carbon intensity formula. On to the next slide, you will see also that uh, when it comes to a software web design module, uh, energy usage cuts across data centers, network, end user usage, and a production. As you can see, our, our project our product mainly focuses on the end user device usage and the data center, which is the two main areas where developers basically have a bit of control over as to when it comes to design decisions and how they implement their code. We will then go on to the general overview, high level overview of how our application is supposed to work. So we have an Android sensor, which we started building ourselves. So my colleague will show you a demo of that later on. We also came across a AWS sensor, which uh, also has uh, gives us the energy from the AWS cloud services. We also have a Linux sensor and hardware sensor. And then, so all these sensors are being brought together by our application to give you this uh, a one plate fits all kind of solution. And the energy measured there is then sent into a MongoDB storage. And this MongoDB storage data is being displayed on a dashboard. So I will hand over to my colleague, Johan, where he will show you our progress so far. Yeah, thank you. Um, here you can see our Grafana dashboard. Um, which combines all the data we are collecting. So like this is some data from the last um, half an hour we've been collecting. And each of these graphs um, correlates to one um, individual component. Um, we, you have uh, two groups here. And one part is data from the Linux sensor and the other part is from the Android sensor. And so most part of is actually from the Linux sensor, um, which is running on my machine I'm presenting with. Um, so we have, um, you can see all of these Docker containers because like our um, Linux sensor works on the container level. Um, you install it on your machine or like in the in your production use case, you would install it on your root server. Um, and then it automatically starts tracking the, the containers. And the containers here, that's the sensor itself. There's a data store, there's like a um, database dashboard, but also this Grafana dashboard, like each of these um, graphs collates to one of them. Um, and like we are, we are using the system Power API, but we're also building on top of it. So we are extending it to not only track um, containers, but also processes, and also have the um, possibility to name and group components. Because right now um, you see these like, um, rather cryptic names for, for each um, graph, which is like the, the, the container ID. Um, but we want to uh, make it possible to give them names like, no, okay, that's my data store, that's my uh, payment server whatsoever. 
but also then grouped in. Okay, like maybe these three components relate to um, the backend part. This is a, um, a edge server, something like that. And then the second part, which is actually only one graph in here, um, is our Android sensor we've been developing in the last weeks. So um, it comes as a Kotlin library. So if you have an Android app, you um, add the Kotlin library and configure it with, uh, with our API key, with um, your account name um, and like um, the name of the app or like the name of the project. And then it automatically starts um, tracking the energy consumption in the background and sending that off to our MongoDB, which you can see here. So like um, we have like a small demo application, it's a to-do app um, and it's mostly just doing a bit of data management. It's sending the data um, across the network to our MongoDB. Um, but already in this very simple case, you can see a few spikes here. Um, and that's actually exactly where we're aiming at, right? Our whole goal is to visualize the energy consumption, which then makes it possible to um, optimize it. So if you see these spikes here, you could now um, start investigating, okay, what happened here? What happened in my server? What happened in my um, client? Maybe you relate this to your other logs, your um, error messages, and then can actually see um, what's been going on there and then start this as the point um, of investigation. Um, so for, for, for Android, the, the da data measurement story is actually rather interesting because since quite a few versions, they have very good energy data and they track internally, but unfortunately they don't give programmatic access to it. And um, so we are building, like we are, we are building on some um, Android operating system APIs, which give us a good estimate. And we also, um, like part of our effort is um, verifying the data. So like we compare our measurement data with um, the data, what for example, Android Studio reports, um, and we can see that the trend and the um, data we are measuring is roughly in line with that. Um, yeah, that's um, that's our demo. And let's go back to the slides. Yeah, so we already, like we're working on this for around two months now, um, but we have um, a lot of things we want to still want to do. Like we want to continue validating our data. We want to continue extending the Power API, but the biggest topic is actually extending the platform support. So we already support Linux now, we support um, Android, but and we want to like um, extend on other client platforms like iOS, the web, um, but also to the cloud providers because um, like a lot of people we talk to, they have their systems either on AWS, on Hetzner, on one of these cloud providers. So it's, and we see it as crucial to support those. And then um, also we want to integrate with the ecosystem. So like there's this the Create Impact Engine framework from the Green Software Foundation. And we can see that the data we are collecting could be then um, could be supplied as a input to the Impact Engine framework to then um, do the SCI calculation and do reporting and also optimization. And then yeah, like also in the current development, we're looking for test users. We're already testing with a few um, people with like small mid-sized setups, but we're always interested in yeah finding more. Yeah, and that's already um, it. And if you want to know more, we have a small website, han.io. Um, you can find some information there, but also wait, ways to contact us if you want to collaborate or find out more. And otherwise, um, we're open for questions. We have had tons and tons of questions coming in. Um, Johan, I'm just going to mute Johan. you while I'm talking because unfortunately we're getting a bit of an echo. So some of you on the feed noticed that there was an echo. We don't know why that is yet. We'll try and work that out. Um, but but for now we'll just ask Johan to unmute himself whenever um, whenever he speaks. Um, first of all, apologies for the slight mix up at the start there. That was actually on our side where the presentation should have come first, um, followed by the uh, the live screen share. But I just yeah, just want to thank you for that amazing demo. Um, we have had tons of comments and questions. First of all, lots of love for the demo. Um, yeah, you know, not particularly, you know, not questions there, but just lots of people saying how wonderful it was and they're really inspired by what you're doing. But we do have lots of questions as well. So 
I'm going to start off and um, yeah, Johan, unmute yourself <laughs> when you're going to speak. Um, the first one was a practical question about the demo. What are the numbers on the Y axis and what measurements are used? Ooh. Yeah, we can't hear you, Johan. Ah, sorry, I, I was muting myself on the laptop as well to okay. reduce the echo. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, and the measurements and what's um, simple as that. Are there any plans there any to take plans carbon to take intensity carbon into account? Yeah, th that was uh, that was a big discussion in the beginning. Like we we showed the the SCI um, the I formula, and in the, in the beginning we wanted to actually um, build the whole process, like not just the energy consumption, but also the localized um, emission factor, the embedded emissions. But um, since we are a rather small team of four people, uh, we really wanted to focus on a smaller scope and try to really build us very well. Um, and then we see um, integrating with something like the Impact Engine Framework um, as the way to go to um, yeah, do the whole um, software carbon intensity story. Amazing. Um, really interesting question from Shirag Mystery. Um, how much CO2 does it actually cost to capture this data? Is that, you know, is capturing this also creating a carbon impact? Um, yes, yes, of course. Um, that, that's, we, we had some fun, fun discussions around that actually. Um, so all, all, the, all the data you saw in our demo now, that's, that's just from the components needed to and me measure the energy actually. So like there, there, there are quite a few components in our case. We, we have the sensor, there's some some formula which smooths out the data. We we have like the data store with the Grafana dash, but all of that obviously uses energy. Um, and then it, the, the big question is, is the, the, the value of tracking that energy higher than the impact you have through tracking it? Um, but we believe that, like especially like in the mid or large scale um, application, the, the 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 value is definitely there. Then it's like just, just a small fraction. Um, and but we are actually we we are using our own system to optimize our own system. So like to we, we are measuring what we are building to then try to see how we can optimize it. Cool. Thank you. And I think Yvette wants to jump in and um, follow up on this as well. Yeah, as um, Johan said, mainly our goal, our focus was on energy. So thank you for bringing up the CO2. It's it's uh, one of the next steps that we 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 seek to kind of uh, go from energy and then convert to CO2 eventually. So just to add to what um, Johan said. Amazing. Um, so I've got a um, a broader question um, for both of you, which is um, how how did you both get involved? And I know you've been part of a wider team building this out as well. But how did you get involved in building these sort of projects? So what what got you interested in green software um, in in particular? You went. Do you want to start? Yeah, I guess I'll go first. Um, so mainly for me, I've been like doing a lot of courses on sustainability. I ended up doing Green Software Foundation course. So, uh, and then at some point, I think for the past few months, our school also, uh, some people in our, some group in our school came up with um, an, a, an initiative where we kind of include sustainability as part of the core things we do in our projects. So um, Johan actually was the first ideator of this project where he kind of uh, called us like, hey, I have this project, this is what it's about. And with the interest that we all had with whatever we can do or contribute to making especially software engineering sustainable. So that's how we kind of got into it. Brilliant. That's Brilliant. amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. For for me, um, so like I've I've been thinking about this topic for quite some time already. Like I've been trying to like always um, combine my 
political values of like a greener future with my profession as a software engineer. And I think like the, the whole green software movement is a great way to achieve that, right? And as Yvette mentioned, um, like we, at our university, um, we are being trained to become software engineers. And since a few semesters, we are also actually making an effort of integrating this whole, how do you build green software? What are the questions you need to ask yourself in the development into the curriculum? Um, because, um, yeah, we believe that's very important for like all the software developers. Brilliant. Well, I just want to say a huge thank you to both of you for that um, amazing presentation and demo. It's really inspiring to see this work. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing how projects like yours integrate into the impact framework as well. Um, we're going to be talking about that a little later in the show. Um, and also, um, you know, we'll we'll make sure that we share the link to um, to your site as well. Um, I don't know if we still have the slide up as well um, for folks that want to get involved, but um, but certainly. Um, be great to see people to contribute to your um, um, to your projects as well as um, you know later we'll talk about how people can contribute to impact framework and I see all of these things working together there it is um, in the future so um, a huge thank you to both of you for um, for being being part of decarb um, and um, yeah I think now um, I I'd love a quick break for a cup of tea how about you um, should we say See you in about five minutes. Yeah. Stay tuned to yes. the event and we'll see you shortly. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Welcome back. Welcome back. That was a slightly longer tea break than anticipated. My kettle was took ages to boil. I'm very, very sorry. Anyway, welcome back to part two of Decarbonized Software. I hope you're all back refreshed, ready for all of the excitement of the next hour. Um, first of all, thank you to all the speakers in the first half. Charlotte, Diana, Chris, Tammy, Jesse, Johan and Yvette. And don't forget, we've had loads of people on the chat asking, will this be available on demand? Yes, yes, it will. Yes, it absolutely will. Um, so don't worry about that. And we'll share the link in the live chat where you can watch it on demand. Um, also, thank you to the steering members submitting to the videos that we've seen today. There's a few more to come after now. So Namrata, shall we have a look at what's coming up in the next hour? Yep, we have a couple of really exciting sessions. Um, next up, we're introducing a really fun program that we spent a lot of time working on. Um, we're going to also um, introduce the much anticipated impact framework and have Simons and the Carbon Aware SDK team coming on stage to lead us through the work that they've been doing to decarbonize software. So is everyone ready? Adam, the floor is yours. Amazing. Thank you, Namrata. Right. Well, I am really excited to be announcing our new Green Software Champions program today. Um, our, our Champions project, uh, oh, the video has come on a little bit early, um, so uh, maybe we can stop that video and start it again. Um, we can just come back to me. Um, our Champions project showcases the amazing work of our community. It is an interactive directory where you can find amazing speakers, writers, organizers, mentors, and open source contributors from around the world. Could we pause the video, please? Could we please restart the video? Right, go just take it off, please. Um, all of our champions are making a huge contribution to the decarbonization of software. So there we go. Why do we have champions? So uh, you may be familiar that we had an existing speakers program. Well, we looked at that speakers program and thought we could do an even better job. So we took our existing speakers and we've built a brand new directory that celebrates all those other activities I've mentioned, such as writing, organizing and open source. And with the Green Software Champions, we really want to celebrate the hard work that our community has put in and make it easier for others to find them. We get asked a lot who our best speakers, writers and organizers are, and now it's easier to find them. So now let's get that video up now. Let's take a look at the site. Um, can we jump back to the start of the video, please? I'll just wait for that to come up. Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, so as you can see, Champions is a directory format. So for now, um, all of our champions are sorted alphabetically. Uh, in the future, we'll actually have digital badges. So 
people will be sorted by contributions. As you can see on the left, we have filters, so you can filter by country, contribution type or project. So let's click on the UK, you can see all of our UK based champs. Um, we've got uh, Sarah Sue here. Um, you can see is we've got really comprehensive activity history sorted by time. Um, and also see, uh, we could see on the left that Sarah works at Goldman Sachs, she's based in London, she speaks both English and Mandarin. And each of these activities is a contribution to the green software community. Um, and there's speaking, there's some patterns work there, she's even writing a book. You can see the GSF contributions and also leadership of projects. Um, let's pick on Daniel Vaughan. He works for our member Mastercard. Again, he's got lots of speaking activities um, and um, you can see that he's been really involved with um, meetups. Um, here's Annie Freeman. She's based in New Zealand. You can um, also see that you can, uh, these activities are clickable, so you can click in to her uh, LinkedIn. And also you can see that we've got links to GitHub and LinkedIn on the side. Now we can search. We can search by Microsoft here. Let's click into Paola. Uh, on here and uh, she's based at Microsoft Italy. She's been really active, including CNCF Sustainability Week. Let's take another look at that filter capability. So uh, filtering on impact framework, here we can see Naveen and Srini. Um, expect to see more names involved in the future. So we've got plenty of docs. Here's a doc on how to contact a champion. Um, it's uh, really easy, normally just through social media. Um, and here's a doc about how to apply. Um, this is what happens if you push become a champion on our main champion site. Um, and we also have um, an about section as well. So if you want to hear more about the program in detail or we'll get involved. So let's take a look at the application journey for a champion. So you should only apply when you have two activities in the Last year and at least one in the last six months. I've put in my GitHub handle. Um, we use that to track a fake email address, uh, my role and organization. Um, really important actually, languages spoken, barely English um, in my case, um, my pronouns and also where I'm based. That's really important so people can search by location. And then a really interesting biography, far more interesting than what I've just put in there. Um, I can also put in a, uh, my social media and a picture as well. And then the first thing we do is add activities. We always add these one at a time. So um, I'm uh, you know, adding in my GitHub handle. We've got all of the different activity types here. There's, there's many, uh, you know, writing, speaking, organizing. Um, I'm going to choose GSF contribution here, and I'm going to link it to a project. In this case, I'm going to choose impact framework, and I'm also going to add in the dates. The end date is optional. Um, I'm going to give it a description, so the activity name, help to add Azure feature, and a link to the GitHub um, issue. Um, I can also add extra context here if I want, such a subtitle, um, and also the description to actually explain to people what you did. Um, and we've also got this common field for activity URL that you can see as well. Um, so um, yeah, that's that's the video, that's the demo. Um, and then um, afterwards, what happens is uh, it takes um, takes a week or two, um, and everything that gets submitted is always considered by the project leads or working group leads as well. So um, when you submit an activity, that will also always be approved by someone. Um, but also, we do expect, you know, and we know a lot of you actually um, do general talks about green software. So um, there's also, you, you know, we can attach it to a general category if you need to. Cool, so I hope that that all makes sense. Please do visit the champion site and have a look around. I don't know if we can bring the link up on screen. Um, uh, oh, that's the meetups one, but uh, um, we'll make sure that we share that link. It is champions.greensoftware.foundation for uh, anyone that wants to take a look at that now. Now, um, Namrata, I wanted to bring you back in to um, you know see what questions you have. There we go, there's the link on screen for everyone. Um, should we bring Namrata in? Thanks, Adam. That was amazing. Um, there are a couple questions. So one, can you just elaborate how the GSF qualifies as champions once people submit their application? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we we, did, we ask all champions to have um, made at least two activity contributions in the last year and one in the previous six months when they apply for the programme. But we also want to make sure that um, that those contributions are, um, you know, uh, you know, there, there's a real, you know, there's a real attachment there that there's a genuine 
um, affinity with the project. So for example, if people say I've made a contribution to impact framework, um, we ask people to provide some documentation, um, it's just a short form as you could say, but we also get our impact framework team just to um, just to sign that off whenever they, they have um, a meeting. And if people have done talks at a conference, we just do a basic check as well to see, um, you know, did you, did you do that talk? Um, but really, you know, what we want to see is a vibrant network of, of champions. So we're not making it really difficult, um, but we're also, um, you know, we're going to, um, bring in things like digital badges in the future to celebrate specific types um, of, um, of activity. You know, we, we understand that if you are um, a pan, you know, a panelist at an event, that's a different level of effort versus doing the keynote at that event. So we do want to reward those in different ways in the long term. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, one of the challenges with these types of programs is making sure that the information is relevant and is up to date. So can you share a little bit about how the program, you know, ensures that the people that are on the website are, in fact, active contributors? How can somebody who's a champion maintain their status? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so for now, we we are, um, you know, certainly for the start of this program, we're asking people to ensure that they have at least those two activities in um, over the previous calendar year. Um, and we're going to be checking every six months to make sure that people are still active. Um, I think that as the program matures, we are probably going to see um, you know, some um, some distinctions in um, the level of activity. And one thing that uh, that I know that Asim briefly mentioned this earlier is that next calendar year we'll be introducing an experts tier as well. Um, and these this is going to be for our most celebrated champions. It's going to be a very small number of people. Um, and we'll have, uh, you know, a much, a much higher bar there, of course, uh, and, you know, it's going to be a small number of people, um, but we also want to make sure that that process is really fair, so we're taking our time. Um, and as I mentioned, the digital badges will also be something that we want to introduce where we can show that people have um, made specific types of contribution. And um, fundamentally, we think it's really important that our community is really engaged in what we're doing and we want to say thanks to them but we also want to make people discoverable so other people if they're looking for someone to collaborate with or they're looking for a speaker or someone that can help them they know where to go on this site thank you so much and last question um given how supportive our community is there's often times when people want to nominate their peers um is that is that possible can people nominate you know, their peers, co-workers for the program? Um, so we haven't got a specific nomination program yet, but um, but we do encourage folks to, uh, you know, to, to go to apply via the Become a Champion button on our website. Um, that's actually a really great suggestion, Namrata. Maybe that's something we should look at and uh, and see what we can do. But obviously, um, you know, in terms of um, people becoming champions and becoming experts in the future, we want them to um, be in control of that as well. So uh, perhaps we can have a short form for people to suggest um, suggest a champion in the future. Thank you so much, Adam. I think those those answers were really insightful. Um, I think we might be ready to share a little bit about our meetup community. Yeah, absolutely. If you're enjoying today's event, why not join us wherever you are for one of our meetup communities around the world? Our interactive map hey, shows communities again. near you, and you can easily click through to find out what's going on locally. We work with communities around the world to bring the best green software groups together and where there's a gap, set up new meetups. Our meetups include talks, panels and hands-on workshops. It's easy to RSVP to an event, just hit attend at the bottom of the event page. Not near a current meetup? Why not check out our global group with all of our online events listed? Visit the link on screen to discover our meetups around the world. Or if you'd like to get involved, email us meetup at greensoftware.foundation. Now it's on with the show. Hi again, everybody. 
Thanks, Adam. It's really great to hear about the new Champions programme. I'm really excited to see everybody get involved, put themselves forward for nomination, share their contributions and get recognition for the contributions that they're making to the community. Up next, we've got guests from Siemens, an organisation which has operated in the engineering and technology sector for over 175 years. Siemens may be the newest steering member at the Green Software Foundation, but their contribution to green software has been an important priority for a really long time. We have Angel Cateron and Stephanie Wolf both working at Siemens Technology in the area of software engineering, joining us to introduce the Sustainable Software Engineering Framework, which defines seven essential topic clusters, ranging from sustainability measurement and models to architecture patterns and practices. Their presentation will look at some exemplary insights into the topic cluster sustainability measurement and models, covering how we can use it to for measurement and estimation of energy consumption of software products as a first step towards reduction. The framework is newly developed but it's, and it's still evolving, but it's already been making an impact, helping to create awareness and transparency and guide software engineers on how to improve the energy and resource efficiency of their software products, helping support software engineering teams in the reduction of energy consumption at Siemens. So without further ado, I'm really excited to welcome Angel and Stephanie onto our virtual stage to tell us more. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the great introduction. So hi, this is Stephanie. And yeah, so I and my colleague Angel will now show you a little bit about our sustainable software engineering framework and what we do there regarding measurement and estimation of the energy consumption of a piece of software. So the topic of our presentation is towards a sustainable software engineering framework, measurement and estimation methods and the implementation as a first step. So at Siemens, we have our degree framework that basically um, reflects Siemens' commitment to sustainability. It's a 360 degree view of sustainability from every angle. And we have those um, six fields of action there. That is decarbonization, ethics, governance, resource efficiency, equity, as well as employability. And if you think about the role of software, I'd like to highlight especially those two fields, decarbonization and resource efficiency, because here our digital offerings and the way we develop them can really help us achieve our sustainability goals. So if we go on with the next slide, um, we have a look at sustainability of digital solutions. So Siemens is basically a technology company. That means that we, um, create lots of um, digital offerings, digital products and solutions that help our customers to really um, reduce the energy or resource consumption. For example, if you think of a digital twin that optimizes a production site. So this is what we, are me what we mean by software for sustainability or green by IT. But this is only one part of the story. So on the other hand, we need to have a look at sustainable software itself, or what it's called as green in IT. So software that is designed and developed in a way that it generates only minimal CO2 emissions. Examples here could be efficient algorithms or minimal hardware requirements. But as there are many more aspects to consider, we developed a sustainable software engineering framework that guides our software engineers in develop more sustainable software products. And that's what we want to have a look at in the next slide. Can we go to the next? Thanks. Yeah. So the basic idea of our um, sustainable software engineering framework is that we consider sustainability as a built-in quality. A building quality and software engineering during the whole software life cycle. And um, well, of course, this means that having sustainability as an additional quality means that you need to balance this, to, to balance sustainability with the other qualities, which is not an easy task. But um, let's have a look at the components of the framework. 
So those um, seven essential topic clusters that we have defined here, they are assigned to different phases like architecture, development and operation, and some of them are considered as core topics. So if we start with architecture patterns and practices, um, we can say, okay, they should consider use case specifics and they should also favor minimum viable solutions because we want to have them to be able to build a more sustainable product based on the right decisions regarding the architectures. Then the code efficiency topic is also important because it helps us to minimize resource usage by, for example, using optimized algorithms. And if we think about the development phase, we of course have efficient agile processes to improve efficiency, reduce waste and promote collaboration. And by doing so, this also again helps us in um, achieving a higher sustainability there and to do a contribution. Um, the goal of Green DevOps is really then to enable for an optimization of the development, building, testing, deployment and operation, and also to have a focus on on an early feedback to development also about um, sustainability related KPIs like an energy consumption to be really able to do a continuous improvement of our software products with respect to their impact on the environment. And finally for the operations phase, so there we want to optimize the operations infrastructure for a more green and resource and sustainable resource usage. And in addition, we have those two core topics. Um, so we need to really encourage all stakeholders of a software product to take over social and environmental responsibility. And this could mean, for example, educating developers, but it could also mean that we need to have some kind of customer empowerment to really also involve our customers closely there or let them um, be able to change the way the software behaves. And as a last part, we have the sustainability measurement and models. And this is actually that topic class that we want to focus on today. So it's an enabler to identify bottlenecks and efficiencies and resource intensive operations to be a first step for optimizations. And it also creates transparency, which is a big and important prerequisite to do those optimizations. And of course, also reflects um, the effects of optimizations, if it's really going the right direction. And here I'd like to hand over to Angel, who will give you some more insights on this topic, sustainability measurement and models. Thank you, Stephanie. So I will, <clears throat> I will give you some details about uh, one of the seven topics of uh, uh, sustainability framework. And uh, uh, I will speak about measurements and models. So when we speak about measurements and models, we have two methods that, uh, that, we, um, uh, that we have in mind. It's about measurement of the energy consumption and estimation of the energy consumption. These two methods, uh, address two uh, specific uh, uh, use cases. So we measure the energy consumption when we have physical access to the hardware that runs our software. And uh, estimation is uh, more suitable when the access to the, to the hardware is not easy or is impossible. Then in this case, we model, uh, we apply models to predict the energy consumption uh, by retrieving relevant features um, from, um, uh, from machines, such as uh, operating system, metrics, uh, uh, values from model specific registries, and so on. And all um, uh, bo both these, uh, uh, these methods uh, converge towards development of guidelines, building blocks, and tools to make um, use of these methods for developers. Next slide, please. Now, uh, some, some details about uh, this part, um, DevOps feedback concept about energy uh, related with, uh, to the uh, energy consumption measurements and estimations. 
Here we have uh, uh, a diagram which refers to a target system, target hardware system, target infrastructure, which uh, uh, runs uh, the observed software. On the left side, we have the uh, components of the um, of the, uh, uh, the 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 layers of the of the system of the uh, hardware system, and in the on the right side, we have the components of the DevOps feedback concept that include a set of probes. We use this probe to collect um, relevant data from different layers of the of the system, and uh, uh, we uh, we 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 use this data if, uh, for for direct measurement or for predicting the energy consumption. For example, if we look at the probes from bottom to the top, um, I uh, we, we exemplified here energy probe, which is used when uh, we have direct access to the hardware and we use a power meter to retrieve the data. Then uh, we um, we have here a virtual en energy probe, which uh, which uh, can be used for estimation of the energy consumption when, uh, for, for example, when we uh, deploy um, in cloud and we cannot directly measure, so we, we, we use models. Um, Operating system metrics, which uh, which can be retrieved from the operating system layers, and for example, Kubernetes probe or Docker probe, which uh, which collect data from uh, Docker uh, containers or uh, for Kubernetes case from Prometheus metrics and so on. All these data retrieved um, by probes are gathered and aggregated at a data processing level. Data processing uh, module does the processing, for example, does the uh, analysis uh, or uh, calculate some uh, actionable insights. The data is uh, persisted in a database, then the actionable in insights or the, the results uh, are delivered to developers uh, who can uh, who can take actions in order to reduce the energy consumption of the of the uh, software application? So this is basically the overview of uh, our DevOps feedback concept, which uh, starts from measuring data, uh, analyzing data, and uh, uh, providing uh, recommendations for for developers. And uh, last slide, please. Uh, so, uh, what uh, what we do in relation with the uh, Green Software Fund Foundation? So we are new uh, uh, steering members uh, of uh, GSF. Uh, we want to to get engaged in development of guidelines, building blocks, tools related to what make it easy to software developers to uh, to focus on their primarily uh, tasks. So uh, and and uh, and uh, um, uh, use the recommendations in uh, for for uh, sustainability. Then uh, we consider sustainability as a built-in quality for future software applications. So we, we we start with sustainability from the first phase of of the development. Uh, as a potential collaboration with with GSF uh, uh, between GSF and Siemens, we see. Uh, um, Three uh, examples, for example, software carbon intensity specification, impact framework, software carbon efficiency rating, and yes, patterns that uh, can uh, where where we can bring real um, support. So this is this was our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to Angel and Stephanie. It's amazing to uh, see your framework and hear a bit about it. It's also really great to see um, sustainability being built in quality th throughout the whole of the software lifecycle being a consideration. Um, and also really amazing to see it, um, sustainability coming up. Uh, you mentioned as a metric and important KPIs that you're tracking. It's really great to see this as an example for the community. Um, 
yeah, also amazing to see how we, we're going to be able to work together with our impact impact framework and some of our other projects, especially where you mentioned at the moment um, you're doing a fair amount of estimation is required to predict the energy consumption in certain areas when you can't measure yourself. We're going to be hearing a bit more about our impact framework next, where we're going to be able to support to bring the, the measurement in, in certain areas, which is really great. Looking forward to working together in that space. So we've got some uh, questions coming in from the community. Pop them in our live chat stream if you haven't already, if you've got any more to raise. So the first one is, what is the role of the green DevOps topic in the sustainable software engineering framework? And what do you plan to do there? Yeah, yeah. so the objective of green DevOps um, is to minimize the resource using uh, usage per release so focus on efficiency avoid waste of resources um, we we use tools to create transparency like this devops feedback concept that uh, includes uh, kpi sustainability related kpis like the energy consumption um, what uh, what can we do is to optimize pipelines so um, in the testing phase to um, to uh, reduce the volume of uh, of uh, um, pipelines that uh, that run uh, then uh, keeping the energy consumption in mind when we optimize these devops pipelines amazing thank you got another question how do you turn what you do with sustainable software into a business advantage? Yeah, that's a really good question. So that's, um, yeah, well, we are, of course are always asked by our management, so why do, we, do you really um, do the research in the direction of sustainable software? Does it really have that impact that we would expect from it to really um, go on with this? So, um, yeah, it's it's really hard to create numbers, you know. So you need to have that kind of measurement set up to be able to create a transparency as a first step, and also to have those guidelines ready for developers and, and software engineers, because we cannot um, expect from our software engineers that are part of various software products uh, projects with hard timelines to really make their own minds about how to consider sustainability. But we need to provide um, the guidelines and the tools to them so that it's really easy to integrate um, these sustainability um, criteria into the projects. And only if we have those kind of tools and building blocks ready, it can be part of the day-to-day -day, um, development business, you know, and then it, it just becomes part of the product itself and then it has an impact. But it's it's a it's a certain way to go. So it's not like we have solved everything there, but we're working in this direction to really have sustainability as one of those building qualities in software engineering established, so that it's it will be part of our way we develop things in the future. That's amazing to hear. Yeah, it's going to be like a, a given thing that we we must consider. It's great to hear. Um, so one more question coming in. So. Are you looking to expand the tool to beyond carbon? You, know, you talked about it, looking at the carbon impacts. Are we looking to expand to consider how it's um, affecting other environmental impacts? Um, well, it, it depends. Of course, we also have some departments at Siemens that do life cycle assessments, for example, that focus on many different impact categories. Um, the thing is that currently um, the focus of the two of us, of Angel and me and our department is rather to provide those um, measurement methods to be included when you apply a life cycle assessment to a software product. Because it's, of course, you have those hardware parts, but now you also need to consider the software side somehow. So we are rather trying to 
have a look at how to get the software part integrated there. And then, um, yeah, we need to jointly develop something with all the other departments at Siemens. But um, we are a big company, so let's see if everything can be put into one tool or how we will uh, proceed there in the future. But of course, it's not just energy consumption, but um, maybe there are some um, different research approaches and we need to find a way how to put this in, into practice in the end, jointly with other departments. Amazing, thank you. You actually answered one of the other questions related to uh, rolling out across the organisation. So well done, thank you. You've probably got time for one or two more. Uh, an interesting one around a virtualised um, environment. So can you elaborate a bit on the models being used for estimation in a virtualised environment, please? Yes. So when um, when we estimate the energy in virtualized environments, we um, we have different approaches. Um, for example, one 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 approach is to uh, to build models. So to to build models in isolated environments uh, to uh, collect data, input data, features, and train AI models. Um, for uh, building such uh, such uh, models, we need relevant data. So um, we did uh, we did this kind of uh, of modeling, uh, collect op um, operating system data, um, usage uh, uh, disk, networking, and uh, all kind of uh, operational data. And this isolated environment is measured in parallel using a power meter. So we we associate input features with the measurement of the power meter and we are able to build an AI model. Then we use this AI model to make predictions in virtualized environment where the, the accessibility is, is, uh, is limited for direct measurements. This is one approach. Another approach, for example, in, in cloud, we can, we can use uh, uh, public data about typical consumption in uh, in um, um, the usual environments, uh, and uh, we can do prediction. We can make prediction predictions based on this kind of data. Amazing! Thank you so much. So insightful to hear. We haven't got any more time for another Q and A, but we have got some more questions banked. So we'll have to send them your way and see if we can get them answered async. Thank you so much again for your time for your talk today. Coming up next, we've got another short video from one of our steering members. Microsoft is one of our founding members, and here's a 60 seconds with their principal green software advocate, Thomas Lewis. Hi, I'm Thomas Lewis, and I'm a principal green software advocate at Microsoft. Um, our organization is within the cloud advocacy group uh, within Microsoft's developer relations, and we're very honored to be one of the founding members of the GSF. And we continue to work with the GSF through our folks who are involved in everything from the steering committee to the working groups to even putting code together for open source projects. Now, one of the questions we always get is what are some of the best practices for our green software journey? And what we always say is the green software journey is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And also don't over index on one thing or another always take a holistic approach to the things that uh, you're doing in your journey. And remember, things change fast in technology and in green software. Um, the tools get better and even technology becomes more efficient. Thanks. It's the moment we've all been waiting for. Well, one of many. I'm delighted to introduce our chairperson and exec director, Asim Hassan, back to the stage. The GSF believes the most important step in green software is measurement. An impact framework will enable us to measure software across environments and software types. But don't take my word for it. Asim, over to you for a full brief and an exclusive look. Thank you so much, Namrata. And, and I was really excited today to see you know, several talks now focused on measurement from Siemens we just heard from and from Code University. We're all aligned um, and all, we're all converging to the same point. Uh, 2024, I believe, will be the year of measurement. Um, 
and doesn't surprise me because when we first launched the foundation, we asked all of our members what their pain points were, and the overwhelming answer was measuring. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we've been trying to explore all the different avenues of measuring over the last three years of the foundation's existence. Um, and we've made lots of progress. And I mentioned earlier on, you know, we the soft, uh, the standards working group launched the software carbon intensity specification, which has reached ISO. We're very excited about that. It should be in the catalog shortly. Uh, we've incubated various data projects because we knew data for measurement was a problem. And we have drove the creation of, of a number of case studies, software measurement case studies. But now we're in the next evolution uh, to have software measurement be a mainstream activity. For this to be an industry with thousands of professionals working to decarbonize software, for businesses to grow and thrive in a commercial software measurement ecosystem, we need to formalize software measurement into a discipline with standards and tooling. And we believe Impact Framework is the tooling and SEI is one of the standards. Um, I'm, today I'm going to explain a little bit about Impact Framework now, then I'll give a demo. I spoke to some of our other co-leads uh, on Impact Framework um, about potential future use cases for the tool last week when I uh, still had some hair and we'll uh, play that afterwards. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so Impact Framework aims to make the environmental impacts of software easier to calculate and share. Impact Framework allows you to calculate your software's applications environmental impacts such as carbon without writing any code. All you have to do is write a simple manifest file. Sometimes you call it an impl and Impact Framework handles the rest. I want to be very clear, it's called Impact Framework, not Carbon Framework. Some of the things I'm going to show you today is about measuring carbon, but our goal for the framework is to go beyond carbon, to start measuring all sorts of different environmental impacts. There are three concepts in Impact Framework. There's the manifest file, which contains either raw data or information about where to get the data from to do your measurements. Then we have models. How do you get from that raw data to, let's say, carbon or water or some other impact? To do that, we need to use models, and we can chain models together to calculate your impacts, just in a pipeline, just like a Unix pipeline. Um, then we have Impact Engine itself, which is uh, the CLI tool, the command line interface. You pass the manifest file to it, and it computes your impacts of your, of your software application. Um, I have a say, saying, transparency builds trust. You don't just calculate and share the number, the final number, that the impact framework gives you. You share the manifest file. You share your workings out. You, you, share, you share all of your data, all of your assumptions, all of your coefficients so other people can verify it, can challenge it, can compute it themselves, can fork it, can adjust it, um, can change some of, your, some of your values and run it again. It's all about being transparent. Only when you share your working out can anyone trust your calculation. The project is entirely open source and composability is a core design principle. We want you to be able to create your own models and plug them into the framework or pick from a broad universe of open source models created by others. We've got some to show you right now, which I can do in the demo, but our goal is for there to be thousands of models all working together. Next slide, please. What I'm going to show you today is a result of almost a year's worth of effort. We first started a talk at this project was proposed in December last year as an incubation project and has evolved into something incredible. And today we're ready to release the alpha version. Alpha means use with extreme caution. There are bugs. I was trying it for the demo today. I found some more bugs. This is a buggy product. Um, we are looking for early adopters who are comfortable with buggy software, non-backward compatible changes. It's, it's moving very, very fast. But if you are, if this is something that you're interested in, please try it out and please give us some feedback. You, but you understand you're on the bleeding edge here. The sense of excitement from everybody involved is something I've rarely seen in this space. 
it's a bit nerdy. I'm about to show you a bunch of YAML files and get really excited about it. But trust me, these YAML files, I think, are going to change the world. One of the things I say about my long-term goals, and I hope the foundation's long-term goals to do with sustainability, is that we want to do to sustainability what open source did to software. I'm not talking about small iterative changes. I want to change the game. And I think the impact framework will do just that. You can find more information about Impact Framework at if.greensoftware.foundation. That's if.greensoftware.foundation. IF will also be the main focus of our yearly hackathon, which will be coming in February 24. We'll have lot, all sorts of prizes this time around, including an under 18s prize um, and prizes for non technical contributions. So watch this space. So now let's start the demo. Can we please bring up the, yep, okay, wonderful. Let me just get myself prepared for a second. Here we go. So um, I've got an empty folder here. Well, it's not empty, but first you would create an empty folder where we can do our work. Impact Framework is built in TypeScript. So you can either use NPM or Yarn to initialize a space to work in. So I'm not gonna run these commands in the space of interest, but you would probably run Yarn in it to initialize the space. And then we want to start adding uh, the, the CLI and the framework itself. So we do yarn add run soft slash impact framework would bring in the framework itself. When we're also going to be using some models, some of those models I spoke about. So we've built some of our own models and we would install them in using IF models. All of this, by the way, this there's a tutorial at if.greensoftware.foundation. So you don't have to be furiously writing this out. And we've also got some other models in an unofficial models uh, package as well. So after you've run all of that, what you need to do is you need to create a manifest file. I mentioned that manifest file earlier on. Now I've already got a manifest file written here, so I'm just gonna open it up. Here we go. So um, this manifest file is a very simple one. It's going to compute the carbon emissions of uh, a, some ser a server we have running on an Azure, um, in, on a, well, on Azure. Um, uh, manifest files can be much, much more complicated than this. Compute different software components, compute network, front end servers, user stories, campaigns, whatever you want. But for this demo purpose, we're keeping it very, very simple. Just one server. Let's walk through the YAML file. I'm just gonna show you, let me just make some space here for a second. I'm just going to go through a couple of the aspects, the, the, the areas in the, in the YAML file so you can understand it, the manifest file. I want to first go through the initialize um, section. So this is where we load up and globally define all those models that you want to use in your application. I'm going to go through, through some examples of this. You're going to see what I'm talking about. Um, you would define, you know, where are you loading this from, you know, because you, you can, you could create a model which you install. This is not we expect a universe where there are thousands of models and you're just cherry picking which models you need to use to calculate your emissions. From um, as some are loaded from an unofficial models. We, we're not Microsoft, so we're, it's unofficial for us to, 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 to maintain the Azure model. But some of these are from our official models. If it's coming from IF models, we're going to maintain this. We're committing to maintaining this. Um, so this is the path of the module where it's coming from. This is the name of the class you're loading. And this is just how we're going to refer to this model in the rest of the YAML file. Let me scroll down to another area, which is called a graph. So this is where we describe all the software components we want to measure. Um, in our case, we just have one server, because uh, again, we're keeping it very, very simple. But you can have dozens, hundreds of software components in it, and it, but it's up to you how you want to group them. Do you want to group all your servers by region? Do you want to have a, a front end, a back end, networking, a database? However, you want to split it up and group it is up to you. We, we leave that very much up to you. It's, it's just different components. Um, let me dig into my server then. So this little, we call it a component. A node. This component node contains all the information required to measure this server. I'm going to start from bottom to top. Um, so I'm first going to start at this node called inputs. These are the inputs. These are the things you've gathered and measured about about this server. 
what we call a key concept in impact framework is something called an observation. This is one observation. An observation is just something you've measured about your running system at a given time and for a given duration. Um, and these are the parameters of your observation. You can actually have multiples of them. We would expect you to have like maybe, you know, you, you grab observations every five minutes throughout the day. So we'd have a large array of observations. I've just got one here. The next thing to really explain is this thing at the pipeline at the top. I mentioned before that we're all about models and a pipeline of models. So the array, um, this observation is the data here is passed in to the first model at the top and it's just a piece of code. It's just a piece of code. And you pass in that observation and whatever it outputs, it passes it to this model. And whatever that outputs, it passes it to this model, to this, to this, to this, to this, to this. And the game we're playing, the game we're playing is we've got this data here, this observation, some data about a virtual machine, and we want to convert this in this use case into carbon. And in order to do that, we chain these models together. They all work and play nicely together to convert all of that data into carbon. Now, to explain this all, it, it, the best thing to do is for me just to comment out some of the other models. I'm going to go through it one at a time, and I'm just going to run um, the command, which is impact engine. You pass in the input file, and you pass in an output file, and you just let it run. The final thing I'll just measure, talk about while, while that's running is the, this config section here. There's a bunch of different places you can configure models. This is one of the places you can configure models. And here, we just have some configuration values which we're passing into some of those models. And this configuration here is specific to this component. So you, different components can have diff different configuration. There's also global configuration as well. So you can see here that file has completed, um, that execution is completed. I'm going to open up the results on this side here. And excitingly, what we've got at the bottom is, is it's the same file, but as well as inputs, we now have outputs. And what the Azure importer model does is we've passed it some data uh, to, to query, and it's going into the Azure monitor system, and it's extracting out information about CPU utilization, the memory available, because this has all been captured on Azure, and we're extracting it um, in, as a series of timestamps. What I've said here is, is for a one hour period of time, um, give me uh, 12 uh, five-minute buckets of the average CPU utilization and, 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 and other data. And it captures other data as well. And a very important piece of data is, what is the instance type of this Azure, the Azure machine that I'm running on? What is the instance type? Um, and What's next? You know, we we know we know it's we we we, pub, we, we know it's Azure because we, we the, the Azure instance the Azure importer gave, gave us that data. We know the instance type, but in order to calculate emissions, we need to know what processor is this instance type. Um, what processor is it? Um, and for this, what we've built is another model called Cloud Instance Metadata. I am going to just run this whilst I talk. So cloud instance uh, metadata is a module we're actually maintaining. What this is actually very challenging. Uh, there's no real globally maintained database of you know telling you this instance type is this processor. Every cloud provider is different. Um, every cloud provider has lots of different rules. So what we we tried lots of different solutions, but what we ended up with is we're actually maintaining this model ourselves. We're maintaining a database of, for every, we've only got Azure for now, but for Azure, this, this instance type is this processor and other information about that. And we, we commit to keep maintaining this for the long term. And hopefully it's all open source. So if you see something missing, please write a pull request and, and, and add it yourself. So you can see now it's complete. I'm gonna go into the results. And uh, in the outputs again, you can see a couple uh, uh, more bits of information have been added. For instance, the physical underlying processor and another very important value, which is a the thermal design power. So you can see here very interestingly that one instance type, if you actually look at the Azure documentation, it doesn't tell you exactly which um, uh, uh, underlying processor you're going to use. Because when you use the instance type, you, you may get one of these three, one of these underlying processes. So it's it's quite challenging then to figure out um, what to do. So we have certain rules and logic which we've worked with the community to to, to describe. And we effectively pick you know what's called the the most 
energy hungry processor of that list because it's always better to overestimate energy than underestimate energy. But now we have physical processor, we have thermal design, we have a bit more information from that cloud instance metadata. We still need, we need to convert this into energy. To get to carbon, we need to know energy. What are some models that we can use to convert this data into energy? Now, a really uh, popular model that people use all the time is TEEDS. It was generated by a gentleman called Benjamin Davies who worked at TEEDS. It was a couple of years ago it was published and he um, figured out a, a, a generalized power curve by analyzing you know, hundreds of servers, different types of servers. And it's quite well used. It's using a lot of our case studies. It's using a lot of places is, is this TEEDS curve. And what TEEDS curve needs in order to estimate energy is it needs a CPU utilization and it needs to know the thermal design power of the processor. Now we have that data, uh, we can run um, the script and it will uh, effectively do a lookup of both of those bits of data to uh, to generate some energy. And uh, you, eagle eyed of you would probably see that I also uh, uncommented SciE. Sci is just a, just a little helper function that we have to um, to copy some data into into other into an energy field. Which is useful for the for the following uh, models, and you can see now we've calculated energy. So we've basically now we've got to the point we've got to the point of we know how much energy for this five minute period we are consuming, um, and this is in kilowatt hours, 0.00284 kilowatt hours. This is one of the bugs. I don't. I want to make sure this is one of the bugs we discovered today that's slightly off. We will be fixing it tonight. But um, this is the uh, this is the well, now we have energy. Now we have energy. How do we get from energy to carbon? Now, what you need to get from energy to carbon, uh, operational carbon, I should say, is you need to know how, 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 clean, how clean or dirty was the energy that you consumed when you consume this energy. That is something called grid carbon intensity. Um, and you would need to know every grid has like a different measure of grid carbon intensity at different times. Um, we have. Um, um, several models that we can use in order to calculate grid carbon intensity. There's a supplier, one, uh, two, two electricity maps and what time are two of the biggest suppliers of this data. They're both members of the Green Software Foundation. We could be using the what time model because we've created one. But um, just to demonstrate another piece of functionality, what we've done in this case is we've actually just, just hard coded it. You know, there are some cases where you want to actually know what the grid carbon intensity every five minutes. There are other cases where you just want to use an annual average. And here's something that's very important. We've put in here 951 grams per kilowatt hour. This isn't hidden away in appendix 96C of PDF 43. It's in the YAML file. It's transparent. You don't, when you're, when you're being shared this YAML file, if you don't like this, you can go, well, do you know what? I actually want to use the what time model to actually get the real time energy or or real time carbon intensity. Or actually, I don't agree with your value. I think it's 951. This is what's so important. Transparency builds trust. We want to share everything, all of your workings out, all of your coefficients, all of your data. That's what you share, not the final number. So now we've run Psi O. Uh, if you go back to the results, you can see at the bottom, we now have operational carbon. So we finally got some carbon value. So for this five minute period, it's 2.7 uh, grams of carbon. And let's scroll down, that's 2.708. And I think there's hopefully there's one that's a bit lower to prove that it's working. Um, well, it is, it is, it is working. Trust me, it just says 2.7. That's because it's, it's, it's hard to find the peaks right now. Um, but it's there, 2.7 grams of carbon per, per five minute period. But we also want to include embodied carbon. You know, we want to include embodied carbon. We want to include other types of carbon emissions. So um, other you know components of the SCI calculation. So obviously being the GSF, we focused on SCI. So now we've also got Psi M, which is, it gives you the embodied carbon. It's very basic right now. You have to provide a lot of the data manually, but we're looking in the future, some of the things we're looking to expand is to, is to make this a bit more automated. So again, it tries to figure out what the embodied carbon is from the instance type and just calculates it more manually. And Psi then actually calculates a Psi, a psi score. Um, so let me run that again. Um, and then um, uh, now I have a slight uh, awkward pause while we wait for that to run. Um, 
And again, it's just that this, the, the, the really important, I, just want to, I cannot reiterate it strongly enough, you do not share the final number, you share the manifest file. Manifest files are executable. There's no need to share the final number. You just share the manifest file and the next person just runs it um, and, they, and it gets the same data. You can actually hard code um, uh, the actual data. You don't need to put the Azure query and you can actually put the results of Azure as inputs and then that would actually be a static file that you could share. So now the, 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 it came through and we can see, um, here we go, we've got the size score, we've got the embodied carbon per five minute period, and we have a, a size score of 32 grams per hour uh, for that five minute period and a 32.4 per hour for that five minute period and 32.2 per hour, 34.2 per hour for that five minute period. So now we've got it, we converted some raw imports into carbon emissions. Um, Okay, so that is um, the very, very final thing I will just mention really, really quickly is um, um, uh, let me talk about another model that's been built by Intel called IEE, Intel Energy Estimator. Intel Energy Est Estimator is a drop-in replacement for other energy models like TEEDS. It just has much more accurate energy estimates for Intel products. It actually has a data for each and every Intel chip type. Um, but the, and this is how you would configure it. And the power of IEE is that I can just go into here and just drop in IEE. Each of these models has standardized interfaces and standardized parameters. Standards is what creates the ecosystem. By having standardized models, we can plug and play, we can cherry pick, we can tune it and get exactly your calculation pipeline that works for you. So let me run that really quickly and as it's running I'll just talk a little bit more about how it actually works because you can see here it's a little bit different I mentioned that impact framework is TypeScript and that means that um, every model that we've seen so far has been written in TypeScript it might call out to some API but it's written in TypeScript you can see here that the IEE was built in Python and what you can do with impact framework is you can actually call out to a CLI tool and do a shell command instead. So you don't have to write your models in TypeScript. You can actually write your models in any language that you want, as long as you can create a CLI tool which adheres to a specific open standard that we've created. It will plug and play into the impact framework, um, which is really, really exciting. That's all for the demo today. You can find more information again, as I said, at if.greensoftware.foundation and as a reminder also in feb next year we'll be hosting our carbon hack again and impact framework will be the focus so please watch this space next up i spoke to naveen and srini two other co-leads of the project about potential future use cases that was last week when i still had uh, hair uh, roll the tape tape please matt so with me today are two, are two of the co-leads of Impact Framework, Srini and Naveen. Naveen, why don't you give a quick introduction to yourself? Yeah, thank you, Asim. Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Naveen Balani. I'm a chief technologist with the uh, Technology Sustainability Innovation Group, uh, working at the intersection of uh, technology and sustainability. I've been involved in uh, foundation uh, right from its inception and uh, leading various uh, projects in the foundation. Over to you, Srini. Hey, thanks, Naveen. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Srini. I'm part of Microsoft. Um, I've also been with the foundation since the beginning and uh, really have, have got an opportunity to do a lot of learning, um, multiple projects, all open source, uh, so many people. So just love the energy here. I think I remember like all the projects that both of you, I remember the journey of all the projects that both of you have been part of since, you know, the very, very early days. And we all started working on kind of measurement with the SCI. Then you both started looking at um, to calculate carbon emissions of software. We needed, we knew we had a data problem and you both went away and started taking the lead on the SCI data project and really started becoming experts in, in just the, the, the data aspects of software. I won't go into all of the iterations, but we had a couple of iterations there until we landed on Impact Framework. I think everybody's just seen, we're just given a demo um, of Impact Framework to a lot of people out there in the world. And they've probably seen like how it works, like in a very practical sense. But I wanted to just have you two here so we can talk a little bit about, you know, future thinking. You know, this is what the Impact Framework is right now. What do we think it can be used for in the future? It's a very generic, it's very um low level so um 
I don't know. I'm going to throw the floor to, to Naveen probably to start off with. Maybe just 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 give us some ideas. Like, what what are your what, what what inspires you about this, and what do you think about applications for the future? Yeah. So I think the future roadmap uh, I think would be to extend the impact engine framework for measuring the SCI scores for an AI application, uh, both during training as uh, well as influence, and uh, from a carbon emission measurement uh, like during the training phase. Uh, so we need to capture the server types like uh, GPU and TPUs have data for embodied emissions and capture various utilizations like uh, memory and CPU. Uh, I think next we need to look at how we could uh, integrate with available models uh, or build models that provide the carbon emission calculation uh, based on uh, available data and obtain the SES code and also include uh, various other factors like uh, data processing and storage uh, as part of the SCI functional boundary uh, for overall uh, AI training. And for the inf inference part, I would say uh, this might be a bit uh, tricky uh, based on your deployment model. Uh, for instance, uh, let's say if you're hosting and have a control of the servers, uh, you can follow a similar measurement approach as in training uh, and using function units uh, such as number of uh, inference calls. But if you have a deployment model, let's say which involves uh, maybe a generative AI system, uh, like sending prompts to uh, chat GPT or any LLM models, uh, you basically need to rely on some proxy data such as uh, API latency, maybe number of iterations uh, to get the right prompt response or overall prompt uh, context and maybe the length and so on. So this is an area of exploration uh, where we need uh, open source uh, communities to collaborate and contribute models uh, based on various uh, research and findings. And probably in the end, our goal is to basically look at in impact engine framework, right? To realize the SCS specification and make it easier to report SCS code for any software workloads. Hmm. Would you would you imagine a future where um, as, as uh, people uh, develop papers and as they develop more advanced algorithms for for AI that alongside this research you deliver uh, a manifest file yes. an impact manifest file where you you are explaining this is this new type of AI algorithm and this is the impact that the algorithm might have copy it fork this file play around with the numbers see how it works for you um, do you see something like yeah, that as yeah. well in the future? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. That's a good point. Uh, having all research uh, papers, right, have this manifest file, right, and which can make mm -hmm. the research also more uh, comparable. And this yeah. can be a framework, right, uh, which can be used by any practitioners, right, to uh, deliver the SCS code. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, we definitely need to apply this to AI. It's a big burgeoning field out there and it's a lot of computers going into that space. Srini, what about you? What, what, what thoughts have you been given to this? What have, have, have you given to this area? Um, I think AI is a fantastic concept because, uh, you know, both the impact framework and AI can learn and build and evolve and emerge together. That's a, that's a great uh, synergy opportunity. But also on the uh, you know the enterprise side, like or or even the consumer side, where you have uh, multiple devices, multiple uh, environments, multiple cloud providers, hyperscale providers, there is a big opportunity uh, with Impact Framework because it truly is an open architecture of bring your own model or bring your own calculation algorithm, and at the very I think when we spoke about it at the inception, the very concept we wanted we want, wanted to do is to make it as granular as possible. So you have building blocks on top, and any technology, whether it you know you have Node.js, you have uh, React.js, or on the server side, anything that you can, you just have to make sure that your granular component is straightforward, mm -hmm. so that you can apply it for any kind of uh, architecture, whether it is mobile or desktop or cloud provider and that's a beauty of the model and that's a beauty of the architecture i feel so that it can scale to any use cases whether it is a consumer use case or an enterprise use case 
Yeah, I I love that term. Bring your bring your own model. I think I think let's put that in all in all the material. I think that's a really good a really good way of explaining, it, isn't it? It's like bring your own model. Yeah. yeah. I remember when we were uh, like one of the things that like both of you have been also to the people who've been, you know, really at the cutting edge of actually calculating software. But there's not many people in this world who've actually put the time and effort to really dig deep and figure out the emissions of 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 of, uh, of a piece of software. And uh, I think one of the things that we discovered throughout our entire process is, as you're saying, Srini, everything's a little bit different. One model does not work for everybody. You need to tweak it a little bit for every single use case and every single, um, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of tweaking and, and can bringing your model to the situation. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the other area is, you know, how do you make sure that you get more people to do case studies, which we had been doing through manual calculations. And that's where <laughs> the open source community can bring in user models for all their use cases and, yeah, uh, you know, we can learn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's been so so many conversations to to get us to this point with this impact framework. It's yeah, so many things we can talk about. One of the things I've like, um, I, I found quite interesting. Uh, I, I was chatting to a large enterprise or an airline, a large enterprise organization. That's an airline, and they were describing and I was explaining impact framework to them, and they were quite interested because they were because they obviously put a lot of RFQs out, a lot of requests for quotes, requests for business. And what and they also have like stringent rules regarding the carbon emissions they want to they want to have carbon limits on like the software that they build. And what they were proposing is is you know when an organized when they put an RFQ out and they get a bid back from an organization, they were suggesting well, as well as a bid, send us a manifest file so we can see not only how much is this thing gonna cost us and how are you gonna architect it, but what are the carbon emissions of your proposed approach. And let me compare versus the other people proposing approaches and, and not just compare on cost, but compare on carbon as well. And I thought that was really, uh, every time we talk to people about impact framework, people always come up with another use case, which is what's so exciting about it, what gives me so ex so much excitement about this project because people are seeing solutions that we didn't think about when we've been talking about this for, for as long as we've been talking about it. Yeah, I think that's a definitely a good use case. Uh... I think of this as a calculator, right? Which you can first create, right? How much emissions uh, your infrastructure will take, and maybe that can be integrated with your CI/CD, Terraform, just to know upfront, right? What what would be mm -hmm. the impact? And if you yeah. can make it simplify this whole integration via plugins or calls, right? And make it native to each uh, programmers, right? The tools that they use. I think uh, we'll, we'll achieve what we want to achieve. Awesome. I think we're coming up, uh, coming up to time now. So one of the things I wanted to make sure that uh, we 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 cover is actually we're we're going to be running a hackathon. We ran a hackathon last year. It was very successful. It was the it was the Carbon Hack with a Carbon or SDK, but the uh, the Carbon Hack will be coming again uh, the first quarter of next year, and uh, the main um, theme of the Carbon Hack will be measurement and measurement with the impact framework. And we're going to be looking for people to build models. There'll be cash prizes. Uh, people build models, build impulse. Uh, we're going to have prizes for best documentation, non-technical contributions, um, all sorts of different prizes. And we're going to, I'm going to have an under 18s prize as well, which I'm really excited for. Um, so we've got the the carbon hack also coming up uh, next year, which is and the main theme is going to be measurement and impact framework. And I'm just so excited to have. Uh, have that on our on our on our agenda. I just want to thank again uh, Naveen and Srini. You both have been just key players in the in the Green Software Foundation since day one. This project evolved from all the work that you've done from the start. And I want to thank you. And uh, I'm really excited to really proud and excited to have you here working all of us together on this project. Thanks, Asim. Thank you, Asim, and thanks for the community. Ooh, I think this is an unrighteous bit, but um, it's good to see you all anyway. I've got a meeting <laughs> a minute right now. Um, so Namrach, I think, is going to come on screen and ask us some, some questions about Impact Framework, if we can get it back on. Thank you. Um, OK, so really excited to finally see Impact Framework. Um, I hope everyone sees why we're so excited and hopeful about the impact 
this open source tool will have on the industry. We've got a lot of questions, so we're going to try and get through um, two of them um, as best as possible. So as an Annie panel asked, would impact framework be recommended for use on a simple website or is it better applied to a more robust application? And Neil Clark added to that question and asked if a website is hosted via a CMS hosting partner like Acquia, um, abstracted quite far away from the actual server, how can we capture observation data? Can you repeat the last question really quickly? The last part of the question, if the... Yeah, so Neil the, added on to Annie's question and said, if a website is hosted via a CMS hosting partner, um, like yeah. Acquia, um, abstracted uh, quite far away from the yeah. actual server, how yeah. can we capture yeah. observation data? Yeah. And to the, to the first question, absolutely. I mean, Impact Framework is very, very general purpose. Even right now, I've been talking to you about how to measure software emissions um, of like a server. One of the samples we have in the in the repast, I believe we still have it, is measuring our website's emissions, which you know, our website is built using GitHub pages. It's, it's a static website. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously it's like a normal website. Um, we haven't actually built the models that are required to measure that. Unfortunately, that's 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 a limiting factor. Is you need models. You need models that convert network bandwidth to uh, uh, CO2. We were going to use CO2 JS. We need models that perhaps take uh, data from uh, a Google Analytics to help then uh, use other data to figure out well what are the what is the energy consumption on the on the client side. So it's, it's all limited by by models. That's that's what we're limited by. But, um, but yeah, you can absolutely uh, measure measure websites. In fact, we've had be uh, spoiler alert. You can measure anything with it. You can measure physical products. Um, you can measure physical products. I'm sorry, my screen's just gone off. So hopefully, uh, you can still all see me. Um, you can measure physical products. And I think the last question was around yes, how can you measure when you don't even have access to the server? Absolutely, that comes up all the time. We're building this thing, you, you build what's called an adapter model. So like, for instance, there's a lot of things even in the server space you don't have access to. Like when you're running like uh, serverless functions, you don't know the server, you just have some other bit of information like gigabyte seconds. Again, it's limited by models. We need models that convert gigabyte seconds to carbon. But we've, we've started to think about how to create those models. And again, as we come on to carbon hack next year, we're really hoping the community comes together and starts filling in those gaps. This is what I'm talking about. We need a thousands of these little models. We, we want to fill those gaps and build those models, and you can cherry pick them together uh, in order to calculate all sorts of carbon impacts and, and other impacts. I, I, my dream is to like add water, add other impacts. I want to. We really, it's called impact framework, not carbon framework. Thanks, awesome. Another question from Cristiano Elias. Uh, I hope I did not butcher your name. Um, is certification support of the results output in the roadmap of impact framework? It's not currently in the roadmap of impact framework, but it is something that we've discussed. For instance, one of the things that's been, um, um, we imagine is the, the models that you use, um, perhaps in the future, we will generate some official models, um, which may be used more in a certification. But if, essentially, if there is any certification, it's a certification of the models. So you might get a whole bunch of models which are useful for a variety of use cases, but only this, certi this certification agency will only approve this small set of models or for this type of computation, we only accept this model pipeline. We imagine it's going to evolve something around that, but we're a little bit early. We're just alpha today. So we're a little bit early on to have any kind of specific roadmap items on certification, um, but it is something that we've, we've thought about. Thank you, Asim. Um, I hope everyone was happy with those answers. We did get a lot of many more questions, but we will answer them at a later time, so stay tuned, subscribe to our newsletter. Right now, um, it's time for our final steering committee uh, member video. So let's hear from Geeta Gandhi from Avanade. Hi, I'm Geeta Gandhi, part of Avanade, a Microsoft Accenture company and Green Software Foundation steering committee member. Sustainability is a cornerstone of Avanade 
and we have focused efforts to reduce and improve environmental issues of technology, processes, and operation. Avanade has a top-down and bottoms-up approach, and our forward-looking leadership is very committed to providing budget initiatives and strategy for Green Software Foundation, Green Forward initiatives. All of our employees are empowered and trained on green software methodology so they can incorporate the best practices into their SDLC. And a lot of our developers are actively in open source tooling for measuring and reducing the carbon footprint. The Green Forward initiative is to have and adopt an employee culture. We are committed to volunteering outside of Earth Day and we have 32,500 hours on it. We are committed to improving and bettering our environment and implement strong governance measures. Our aim is to be net zero by 2025. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to Avenard and all of our steering members for sharing those videos today. I'm um, talking of Avenard, uh, Dan Benita is in the room. He's also been joined by Microsoft's Vaughan Knight. Um, I'd like to welcome you in, guys. Um, also, I'm pleased to say that Vaughan isn't actually joining us from Sydney, Australia, since it's something like half three in the morning there. Instead, he's joining us from the Pacific Northwest of the USA, where it's a rather friendlier, well, uh, 10 to 9 in the morning. We are running a little bit late. Um, nothing like doing live live stream before the working day begins anyway. Um, and Dan and Vaughan have been key contributors to the Carbon Aware SDK, and they're going to give us a demo of how they're using this, not just in their professional life, but also in their household. So guys, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, my name is Bon Knight. I'm a principal engineering manager uh, at Microsoft, and uh, I'm also the the lead contributor on the Carbon Aware SDK. And Dan, yes, hi everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm Dan Benita. I work for Avenad as a software, um, sorry, solution architect in software engineering and IoT, uh, and I'm also one of the principal contributor for the SDK. Um, so if we can have the slides. <laughs> slides on their way, guys. I'm still here in the background. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so. Dan, do you want to go to the next next slide? Oh yeah, can we yeah, can we go to the next slide? So yes, yeah, so we've done the introductions already. So thank you very much. So uh, we wanted to start with a quick uh, word on the carbon SDK. Um, try and like highlight the the quick um, uh, sorry like in a nutshell what, what does it provide to you? Um, so um, carbon awareness is about uh, using energy when it is the cleanest. Uh, what that means, and you've probably heard it a few times already, is that producing that energy emits the least amount of carbon. And so um, luckily for us, there's a lot of provider of data that can help us do that. And the carbon aware SDK is there to help us get a unified approach on top of those data sources. Um, the, um, we also know that uh, what you can't uh, measure, uh, you can't improve, and therefore um, the carbon SDK is there to help us with reporting and forecasting. And finally, because um, there are many ways of potentially doing this if you don't use a unified approach, uh, here this is meant to help us have a standard and therefore provide us with uh, high integrity and auditability so that when we're comparing numbers between um, different locations, uh, different companies, uh, we're, company, we're, we're comparing green apples with green apples. Um, so, you know, having worked on the Carbon Aware SDK at some point, I thought like, how can I uh, 
apply this to uh, daily life uh, and in particular at home. And uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, I, w I wonder how to use the uh, the carbon uh, aware SDK at home. And so and so there, um, you know, carbon awareness provides us with uh, three possibilities. Uh, the first one is location. Um, so 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 when we think about applying this, um, you know, uh, I had to think about what are the biggest consumer of electricity or energy in the in the house. In this case, electricity. And so, um, you know, washing machine, dishwasher, charging your electric car if you've got one. Um, um, kettle, etc. And so uh, I thought, okay, well, let's um, apply the carbon awareness uh, to, let's say, the washing machine. Uh, now, uh, the first principle is around location, and location doesn't apply here for me because I live at home. Uh, I can't take the washing to my mom anymore. She lives abroad. Uh, so I have to do this at home. And so uh, the next option for me is time shifting, meaning changing the time at which I'm going to be running that load so that I have a better chance of the energy being cleaner. And so here on that diagram, you can see how we can poten potentially um, uh, visually measure that or, or that we're going to be, identif be able to identify those times to forecast that uh, better. Um, uh, another principle that I should mention while we're at it is uh, demand shaping as well. It's also carbon awareness. And it's about when you are at those times that are cleanest, why don't you just maybe do more at this time so that um, it's done and you don't have to worry about whether it's uh, uh, whether you're using you're emitting more carbon uh, at a different time of the day. So um, so uh, so so if we go to the next slide, um, I basically then use the carbon or SDK to capture some of this data. Uh, I also have. Um, um, uh, an energy provider that uh, allows me to access the data through API, but it's very simply also simply by uh, exporting it in CSV, so kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and so I could load this into the Azure Data Explorer, uh, over, overlay the data that has the, the average carbon rating, which is the red line on this on the screen, and uh, the total energy consumption uh, per half an hour, uh, which is the blue line on the screen. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but when you put those two things on top of each other, um, the carbon intensity seems to be highest when my usage is the highest. And so what I did is I used the carbon, the, 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 the sorry, the, uh, the data explorer to simulate if I was to move that data now, sorry, that uh, that uh, that consumption at a different time. Uh, and so by 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 doing a few tests, I ended up. Uh, seeing that seven hours shift in this case was best, um, and that helped me reduce my consumption by uh, thirty percent. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we can we can see that a little bit better. So in this case, the um, the consumption has shifted to later in the night. Uh, I've put uh, green light green lines with arrows just to highlight a few points where it's the most obvious, and we can see that uh, you know all of a sudden we can match those moments that are that are cleaner in the day. Um, and so, um, and so we end up with a with a great saving. Um, another thing I'd like to highlight here is that um, you know by by using potentially more granular data, we can end up with uh, better uh, measurements as well. Because what we want is if you're if you're making the effort of uh, changing your uh, the, the shifting your load, uh, you also want to be able to reflect that in your metrics. And I did a few tests, and and I could see that by by just Using more granularity, I also um, uh, was able to to notice a, a, a decrease of twenty percent of the carbon awareness that was reported otherwise. Um, so I think that's uh, that's another thing to keep in mind is that being able to have access to more granular data can help you not only be more accurate but also have a, a, a better reflection of of the efforts you're putting into being greener. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, I'd like to conclude on just what happened, just to, to remind you. So I used the carbon SDK to get the emission data. I extracted the energy data from my provider. I put those two things in the tool. In my case, it was Azure Data Explorer. And uh, I was able to notice uh, such a, uh, in a simple way, uh, improvement. And so if I can do this at home so easily, why can't we just do this at work? Uh, Vaughn, what do you think? Yeah, thanks, Dan. So uh, if we just go to the next slide, so 
one of the things that we we need to uh, start thinking about is, you know, how do you create a sustainable software engineering culture within an organization and how can you bring some of the lessons from home into your organization? It's very much about building habits and small steps. You know, it's not about just tra changing everything overnight as much as we'd love that to happen. It's really about taking these small steps and it's not this big undertaking to start. Um, the thing that we've found, especially with the engineering teams I work with here at Microsoft and, and the organizations that we work with, is it's really to treat it as a culture and emotion, not just as a checkbox. Like, were we green today? It's great to know, but are we behaving and are we thinking in a green manner? You know, what can we make greener? You know, when when is it going to be greener to be running these workloads and building those habits and having those conversations? You know, you need to be able to review the things that you're doing, building observability into the platform and being very intentional about it. Um, going on to the next slide, please. So, you know, when you think about how can you impact your organization to do today and how, create that culture, it's very much about starting small. Now, not all of it's about carbon or SDK. Some of it can be things like, are you shutting down your dev test servers on the weekends? You know, uh, are we incorporating sustainable engineering principles when we're designing software? We have teams where there is an architectural discussion around which architecture is better. And really, you could flip a coin and they'd both be fine. But when you start incorporating sustainable engineering principles into those decisions, one of them becomes the clear leader. It can really help uh, unlock those stalemate situations. Um, and you can start at home yourself. You know, what if you're in your washing machine two hours later, sort of like Dan's scenario, or, you know, things like what we do is in our retros and our stand ups, we actually have this thing where it's like before the retro, before the stand, like go around the house and turn the lights off to create this sort of concept of thinking sustainably when we're going into these, these uh, meetings where we're talking about software. It's really important to use real data and not to make assumptions. You know, when energy is the cheapest, it must be the, you know, the, the lowest carbon emissions. It's at those sorts of assumptions tend to get you into trouble. And very similarly, the biggest part of our system must be the biggest emitter of carbon. It might not be, right? A small part of your system that's used a lot might actually be something that emits the most carbon. Um, and the next thing is, you know, Start by using the Carbon or SDK to gather that data, even if it's hypothetical. You know, what if we ran this ML training job two hours later? What if we shifted these workloads around? What would happen? What if we did this over 12 months? What would the impact be? Go to the next slide, thanks. And so every like every little bit counts. And so you can start small and then you can grow from there. But we need to remember, like, even with things like Xbox and Windows Update, they are now looking at updating and sustainable and low emissions times. All the phone manufacturers now are looking at uh, charging your phones and your, charge, your phones charging in more sustainable, low emissions ways. Um, uh, the UBS work with the GSF and Microsoft around sh time shifting the ML uh, model training that they were doing to reduce emissions. So. It, they, that takes all different shapes. You know, you can have a low intensity workload with high throughput, you know, 10 million requests, but only 0.1 gram per request means it's still one ton of CO2 equivalent. Or even like a phone app, which has got a million users over its lifetime, if it's one gram per user, you're looking at one ton of CO2 emissions. So going to the next slide. So your mission, if you choose to accept it, on the next one slide, please. is very much to take action, right? It's not to solve everything today, but it's just to start. And that's very, very possible. It's a mission possible, right? It's not mission impossible. Green software is more efficient, resilient, and it, offer, and it often costs less to run. If you're think, talking to your leadership and they're not sort of sold on the green aspect of green software, you can really sell them on everything else. So make a plan, take some action, even if it's hypothetical. Head on, head on over to learn. If you don't, still not sure where to start, Grab the Carbon or SDK and start today as well. Reach out to us, myself, Dan, and the team, uh, on GitHub, or by here, just to to make sure that you know where we're here to sort of also support where to start and point you in the right direction. Maybe there's something missing in our documentation. You can help us find that out so that we can update it and make it even clearer and easier for everybody else. Um, and make sustainable software something that you believe in and act on every day, not just sort of like something you do once to say, hey, we were green. It's really changing the culture 
And it's very much about building greener software today for a greener future tomorrow. So thanks. Go to Q&A. Thank you, folks. That's that was really, really interesting content. And I think, you know, I was also personally really interested as someone who's been trying to do a lot about reducing my own carbon impact at home. I've got quite a lot of smart tech in my in my house. I'm not using carbon aware STK at home yet, but I think you've you've inspired me a bit. Um, I'm sort of also interested because I, I'm in the UK. My energy provider um, has solutions like car charging car at um, lower cost or lower carbon times. Um, and uh, you know various you know they they put in different blocks depending on uh, what's happening in the grid. I'm not seeing a, a strict correlation to carbon intensity yet. Uh, a lot of it still seems to be down to cost, but I'm interested to see whether that will uh, um, change over time. But um, I've also seen that, you know, for example, you can I've got Home Assistant at home. You can um, you can integrate things like electricity maps into there, and it can show you on you show so you don't have to be a developer to. Um, build any of that stuff and um, yeah I'll be interested to see what, how easy it would be to put carbon aware SDK into home assistant tell me a little bit more about um, what you know how everything's behaving and potentially you know automate turning things on and off at the right times so so it's funny you say that because I've got the same setup at home and um, you can you can um, uh, display your um, carbon rating in real time using uh, the co2 signal uh, plugin from electricity maps and um uh so so yeah very easy I'll, I'll probably show you later and we can see how we can maybe uh, share that with yeah, others yeah. Um, that in terms of <laughs> yeah in terms of the electricity provider to be honest that's almost how it started for me um so so the reason why the the, the graph looked a little bit uh, too nice is because i'm using solar panels and i've got batteries during the day so during the day i'm covered from a green uh energy point of view but at night that's why i struggle a little bit and so i was curious to know is it greener if i use the electricity at night um and if i shift all my workloads uh, uh during those times where uh it's also cheaper to be honest and and it is um based on the calculations i did it is cleaner it, it is cleaner and i can see a very clear almost uh, moment where that consumption drops and when this thing starts um, it's not consistent it's not always always the exact same thing there isn't a, a proper rule of thumb that you can use and say today i'm going to do it this way and it's going to be the case but on average it definitely is and i think we also have to think about that that you know you can't worry about every single gram of a, uh, uh, of carbon that you're going to be emitting if as it was mentioned earlier, I think during one of the of the demos, it takes you much more uh, emission for you to even just think about it. Um, so it's good to also think in in averages, and and that's where this helps by looking at the history. You can start making a better pre um, um, forecasting for the future, and uh, on the whole, be a lot more efficient without yeah. spending too much time measuring it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's there's something to be said about giving power to the consumer here. I mean, I uh, I know, for example, that in 20 minutes from now, um, there's going to be a lot of strain on the grid and I'm deliberately going to be dumping about three, three and a half kilowatts of my battery into the grid and I'm going to get paid for it. It's it's an incentive. You need to incentivize the, you know, the consumer, so to speak. We are consumers as well as software practitioners after all. So, um, but yeah, it'd be great to see that grow. And th I don't want to, uh, that was my question. We've had some, some other questions as well. That I'd love to quickly jump to. Um, so um, there is a question um, which is for Vaughan. Um, with your experience in Microsoft, how important is the what if question to convincing leadership to invest in carbon aware computing? Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, it comes up quite a lot and it can affect all different sorts of things. It could just be, uh, for example, we were working with one organization about a large organization about moving workloads between data centers and it was within the country, but they didn't have security. The security team said, no, we can't justify going into another data center. It increases our risk profile. And by doing the sort of the hypothetical what if, they were able to say, well, if we did this, we would reduce our emissions by this much. So therefore there is a business justification to do it outside of, we just want to be in another data center. And so therefore the security team then had to go and sort of review the security risk and sort of bring that into the 
you know, compliant data centers that they could de deploy into, but it was off the back of the emissions conversation. There was no, no nothing else was driving it uh, or getting it over the line, but the emissions conversation absolutely got it over the line. And then the other one is, so that was about move, just moving data center, putting workloads in a different data center. And then in terms of changing software, being able to say, hey, we need to make this more efficient because this is where all of our emissions are. It sort of drives that investment and that return on investment. I think there's a lot of uh, probably, you know, hey, well, let's go and look at this and make it greener. And we think it's going to be greener. And that unfortunately isn't enough for a lot of the large organizations to move. Whereas being saying, hey, this piece of our software we know is emitting the most emissions we should be reviewing it because we know we can have an impact here and then people go you know the leadership goes great we'll invest the money there to to go and improve that or reduce the emissions there so i think it's it's incredibly important not just for time shifting and location shifting but also about creating efficiency in software and putting investment do you do you think there's going to be pressure on um, you know, you know, on the hyperscale cloud. Well, no, actually, maybe not. On, do you think there's going to be pressure on software companies and uh, you know to think about not just when their um, loads are running, but but where, based on how intense the grid is geographically? And do you think that will filter, to, you know, to the hyperscale cloud providers to have sort of more demand on a, a region that is considered to be um, to have lower carbon intensity? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I could speak. You know, Microsoft, we do have data centers that are running very, very green, especially in a lot of the countries where there's a lot of hydropower, for example. I know we want to meet our sustainability commitments, and so there is that side of it. I feel it's going to get tougher and tougher for the organizations that are just running their own data centers to be able to, to uh, compete with that. And I don't mean from our perspective, as in, you know, at Microsoft, you know, you're not going to be able to compete. I mean, if you everybody's running their own data centers and their own locations with their own overheads and all these individual overheads relying on local grids and not their own data, uh, sorry, their own power um, and generating their own power, which a lot of the hyperscale providers are looking at is that power. How do we generate enough power running hyperscale data centers that we're not you know, becoming a drain on that country's power source and green power supply as well. I think that's going to become very hard for for others from an emissions perspective to to be able to compete with. It's just it's just going to be something that that I think the the large organisations and the hyperscale cloud providers um, are doubling down in that and research into that. And I think that investment is going to be what what really sort of makes it accelerate away from from the other efforts unfortunately for those people but also fortunately for everybody because everyone can deploy into it Brilliant. well um do you know what I, I we've got so many questions backed up i feel like this is another one of those topics where we might need to set aside another another session we talked uh, it's funny asim and i had a and namrat and i we had we had a little chat in the um, while one of the videos was playing, we say, you know, really some of these measurement topics, you know, really need a bit more time. So we're going to we're going to work on a little strategy to see how we can give a bit more time up to these, because 15 minutes, it wasn't enough, was it? There's there's so much more to say. But um, I want to thank you both for giving your time for this and um, giving just su such clear examples of, of why this is relevant. I don't know if we are able to put the uh, the URL of the Carbon Aware SDK on screen, um, or we can we can share it in the chat. But um, you know, do go. Um, oh, there there we go. Uh, green greensuft.org forward slash ca dash SDK. Um, and yeah, do check that out as well as the Learn site that you mentioned, Vaughan, as well. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Right. Well, um, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and um, I think we are pretty much almost at the end of the event. It is time to hand back to my colleague, Sophie. Sophie, over to you. Thanks so much, Adam. What a brilliant insight into the Carbon Aware SDK, which is one of our open source working group projects. It's so great to see uh, how it's being used in the real world. So thanks, Dan and Vaughan again. And I want to say a big thank you to all of our speakers today. We are coming to a close of the event shortly. But just before we close the event, we're going to bring Asim back onto the stage to share a bit about what lies ahead for the GSF. Looking forward towards the end of the year and into 2024. Thanks, Asim.
<clears throat> I'm on mute. I knew it was going to happen today, but it happened. Um, do we, have, do, we, do we have a slide to share? I think at this at this at this uh, start of the stage. Um, if not, like I think some of the some of the um, things we've spoken about today are are some of the th things I'm, I'm I'm incredibly excited about. So we we spoke a lot about impact framework. I think everybody can tell how excited I am about impact framework. Um, and uh, it, it's it's something that I actually proposed uh, a year ago, and, and there's been so much interest in this space, so much discussions, and, and we can really, really, really see how this can help. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that. And that's also connected to Carbon Hack, which is again we we're, we're, we're we're talking about it for next year. Um, well, last year's Carbon Hack was incredibly successful. We beyond all of our wildest dreams. And so next year's will be running, I think the tentative dates now, the 26th of February to 15th of March, 2024. We'll be announcing it shortly. And here we go. And Carbon Hack and, and, and the focus for Carbon Hack will be impact framework. And one of the things I really want to do for Carbon Hack next year is to really expand out and really broaden up the category. So I mentioned before, like I'm really excited for an under 18s category. We, we need to speak to all age groups. Um, and I'm really excited to have non-technical contributions as well. We didn't have that last year. Let's have non-technical contributions writing. And I'm, I write a lot. Let's talk about, let's speak to writers. Um, uh, green software experts. So Adam was talking, so we, 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 when we first launched the foundation, honestly, my first, before launching, the first few conversations I was having with organizations, I would talk about launching an MVP program like Green Software Champions. We spoke about it a couple of years ago and when we said, you know what, the, the ecosystem's not quite there ready yet for Green Software Champions, but we're there now. We've got Champions program, it's up and running, it's so exciting. We've got the Experts program coming up next year. And finally, like the Global Summit, we ran it last year. We did not manage to run it yes this year, but we're running again next year. These are localized events in specific cities, sometimes in local languages for uh, around a two week period. They'll be happening around June this year. Um, and I'm very, very excited about that. Um, before I leave, I just wanna say a couple of things. I want to give a huge thank you to Adam, especially. Um, he's put an enormous amount of effort into this event um, and it really does show, but also to the rest of the team, to Namrata, to Sophie, to the people not here, out, to, to Russell, to Sean, to Joseph, to Jenya, to Osama, to Narek, to Keaton, Vienna, Erz, Chris, Stephanie. There's a large number of people involved in the foundation. I'm very, very proud of the, of the whole team. Also, huge thanks to our chairs and our project lead who volunteer their time. I'm always humbled, we've, we've met a lot of them today, Vaughn and Dan just now. I'm always humbled by your passion and dedication to this space, so thank you again. To the steering committee, I value, deeply value your mentorship and guidance. We would not be here without you, and we would not have the impact we have today without you, thank you. And finally, thank you to all of our members and everybody who's been contributing to the work we do Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, that's all I have to say. Wow. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how to follow that. I was going to say thanks to everyone, but you, you, you've done oh, it and you've, you've come know, up with more, way more names than, than I ever was going to as well. So um, that's really well remembered. Wow. Um, so I think that all we can do is say once more thank you to uh, for everyone. Thank you uh, for watching. Um, I want to also just thank um, our folks behind the scenes, Matt and Alexis, who've um, worked to bring this event to you today. Um, and the event is going to be available on demand. So if you go to decarb.greensoft.foundation, straight after the show, you will already see the event. The, is, you can replay it and we're going to chop it up into little bite-sized chunks. There you go there, it's, it's on screen. So, uh, you know, please do go back and watch your favourite bits. And we also want to continue the discussion on GitHub as well. So if you go to, there we go, uh, greensoft.org forward slash decarb forward slash chat, or if you just find Green Software Foundation on GitHub and click discussions, you're going to find a vibrant forum of software practitioners and related folks in the IT industry that really care about this. Please join us on there, continue the conversation. And with that final thank you to the co-hosts. Let's just get the picture of all four of us up. Yeah, let's do, I said, I said we were going to end like the Muppet Show, we're all going to wave and say bye-bye. And thanks for watching. All right.